As it is necessary, necessary to protect public health, safety, and welfare, Williamson County Schools is officially meeting electronically in light of the coronavirus pursuant to executive orders number 16 and number 78 signed by Governor Bill Lee and waiver of Williamson County School Board Policy 1.400. Welcome and board members, will you please record your attendance via a roll call vote? Ms. Glenn? Madam Chair, this is Lydia Glenn. Angela Durham. Angela Durham, present. Dan Cash. Dan Cash, present. Elliot Mitchell. Elliot Mitchell, present. Brad Fiscus. Brad Fiscus, present. Jenna Priya. Sapriya. Jay Galbraith. Jay Galbraith, present. Sheila Cleveland. Sheila Cleveland present. Candy Emerson. Ms. Emerson. Rick Wimberly. Rick Wimberly present. Eric Welch. Eric Welch present. Casey Hall. Casey Hall present. Nancy Garrett. Nancy Garrett present. Madam Chair, you have 10 board members in attendance tonight. Thank you, uh, and board members, I want to let you know that uh, Ms. Apriya says that she's having some internet complications right now, but that she should be here when those resolve. At this time, um, board member Angela Durham will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be followed by a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, board members. Ms. Flynn, I do see Ms. Apriya in the meeting. Yes, ma'am, I have uh, marked her present. Okay, thank you so much. Now we move on to items of particular public interest, which is our public comment portion of the meeting. And it's my understanding that we have 16 speakers. Uh, so speakers, um, if you will, uh, set your timers for two minutes. You'll all have two minutes to speak. Uh, we have received your addresses and those have been um, compiled by the central office by Ms. Glenn, and those, those addresses will be part of our meeting minutes. We are uh, responding to some public input about addresses, and so we have implemented that change uh, as of this meeting. Um, I want to, before we, before we start calling folks, and I will call your name in the order that your request to speak came in, um, the governor's orders do not require public comment during uh, this time of meeting virtually. However, um, our board felt like that we did want to continue to hear from the public during this time. So we are continuing with public comment. Um, and as always, uh, people who are interested in um, hearing from the board, um, please send us emails. And also uh, we're always happy if uh, you wanna talk on the phone as well. Uh, but this is one way uh, that your concern can be uh, uh, read into the record at the monthly meeting. Uh, I want to make sure all the public commenters know that the board does not respond to your comments during this time. It's just a place to register your comments. And that the board does reserve the right uh, to limit the time of any speaker and terminate remarks if, that, if there is any disruption or um, lack of adherence to the rules that I've talked about. Um, so with that, we will go ahead and hear from our speakers and let me get the first name for you. Um, speakers, I should also tell you that Mr. Casey Haw, our vice chairman, um, is the person who has the duty of, of timing the comments and calling time when, uh, when the, your time has expired. So Mr. Haw, if you'll raise your hand so that people can see you. Um, and if you hear Mr. Haas say time, it will be time to wind up your remarks. So our first speaker is, and again, excuse me if I mispronounce your name. Our first speaker is Karen Rail. 
Ms. Rayl? Ms. Rayl, if you can hold your, oh, there you go, great. Got it, thank you. Sure. Um, hello, board, thank you. My name is Karen Rayl. I have two students at Ravenwood High School. And tonight I wanted to talk about registration and next year goals. Can you hear me? Um, I disagree with WCS requiring that we register for online or in-person um, next year without a commitment from them on what next year will look like. We have to do this by tomorrow. You're asking us to commit our children to a year of learning, but you have not committed to parents on how you're going to exit out of the current state. Is it at zero cases that we get at back to normal? Is it at two cases that we get back to normal? Give us a realistic number to get back to normal. We need an exit strategy. For 2021-22, I want masks to be optional. WCS needs to also stop the mask quarantining. We have healthy kids that are begging to go to school and you acting as an arm of the health department have told them no kids first. You work for them, not the health department. For 2021-22, we want the year to be to return to normal. We want recesses, lunches, sports, band, homecoming parades, proms. We want it all back. Everything that was taken away from students this year needs to be reinstituted. We are done. For those not comfortable with normal, there is the online option. Our children are paying the price for this pandemic with their physical, mental, and academic health. Please stop this. The following people have agreed with what I have said this evening and gave me permission to speak on their behalf. Amanda Elliott, two children, Trinity Elementary. Kelly McCleskey, two kids, College Grove Elementary. Allison Hill, one child, Thompson Station Middle. Jonah Elmore, three children, Hunter's Bend Elementary, Grassland Middle, Franklin High. Kim Godden, one student, Grassland Middle. Michelle Sutton, two for this fall, Creekside Elementary. Marie Perigo. Thank you, Thank you, Ms. Rail. And if you, uh, Ms. Rail, if you have, know the district that you live in, uh, the board is asking me to know districts since we're not asking for addresses. So, uh, Ms. Rail, if you can tell us what district you're in and then other speakers, if you can also tell us if you know. And if you don't know, that's perfectly fine. I do not know, but we're zoned for Sunset. Elementary, Sunset Middle, and Ravenwood High. All right. Thank you. Our next speaker is Harmony Kennedy. Hello. Um, my name is Harmony Kennedy. I live in Nolensville on Bosch Drive. I am a ninth grader at Nolensville High School. During the years I have been in WCS, I've experienced countless acts of racism. When I was in the sixth grade, a boy came over to me in the cafeteria and called me the N-word. I reported it to the assistant principal. She did not hold the she did hold the boy accountable, but she also told me that this is going to happen throughout my school career. I thought to myself, this response was completely unacceptable because why should I be ex expected to just get used to racism? Another incident happened in seventh grade. One day in class, several of my classmates called me ghetto and ratchet because I had braids in my hair. When I reported the incident, the teacher tried to portray me as the angry black girl, like I was the problem. Later that year, a student held me back, told me to go back to where I came from. I didn't know why people kept coming up to me and making these racist comments. I felt angry, hurt, and like something was wrong with me. Their little sister has been called a monkey by one of her classmates. I never want another student to experience what my little sister and I and many of my friends experience as students of as a student of WCS. I hope me speaking to you all will help bring change to this district. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jada Morell. Uh, Ms. Morell, I believe you're on mute. Okay, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, hi, my name is Jada Muriel. Um, I would just like to thank all of you, all the members of the board today for allowing us this opportunity to speak to you guys to encourage change in Williamson County School. Um, I graduated in 2015 from Franklin High School. 
And my senior year of college, I received messages from girls in my soccer team, basically racial slurs through this app called GroupMe. And in these messages, you know, there were slurs saying like, you know, why didn't she live in Cottonwood? Why um, like slot A, like just racial slurs that dated back to the 1800s. And I went to the principal and nothing happened after I showed her evidence of what happened in the group messages. Um, but that's my story and there's many other stories like mine. And I'm just here today to ask the members of the board to hopefully consider keeping the consultant past July. Um, I see from looking at the website um, of Fostering Healthy Solutions that the consultant can help offer a new perspective, one that is not biased, um, where they don't have deep roots in Franklin, like family um, or friends that live here or children that go to high school um, at many of the different schools in Williamson County. They, so they won't act to, they won't act for their own interests. They have a unbiased view. And I think that's important when trying to level with all the different parties involved. Um, I also think, I think it's a great first step and trying to implement change in Williamson County, because obviously we all know now that there is a problem and that needs to be fixed. And I think it's great to have a professional trained to that specializes in cultivating a system that will help all students um, feel welcome. Thanks. Time, ma'am. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no. Okay. Problem. Thank you. Um, thank you. Our next speaker is Jessica Cordova. Ooh, I think I was on mute. I'm sorry. Um, my name is Jessica Cordova, and I am a parent of a student in Thompson Station Elementary School. And um, kind of shifting gears a little bit, um, my concern is more so regarding next year and a, a hope for return to some sort of normalcy um, now that our active cases in Williamson County have been holding steady, despite the fact that the mask mandate has been lifted. Um, you know, there really has, even in the past year, been no real large scale data that masks um, are effective in um, actually preventing the spread of COVID. Um, so I'm really here to advocate to lift the mask mandate for our children in Williamson County. Um, next year, um, because as of April 5th, all Tennesseans over the age of 16 will have access to the vaccine. And, you know, the data is really showing that um, the most recent from the CDC, as of March 19th, um, is showing that there is no real um, compounding evidence that we're seeing transmission from student to student and student to faculty in our schools. Um, so, Really, if we can push to make masks optional for our children next year, um, it, to make recess um, more normal so the grade levels can all go out together and don't have to be separated. Um, and also so that the students can have lunch in the cafeteria um, rather than in the classrooms and again, being separated. Um, my second grader has had a real hard time because she has made a lot of good friends from her class last year that she has not been able to see as frequently this year. Um, I think it's really separating the classes. Um, so really we're just trying to push for more normalcy. Um, 10 seconds. Uh, yep, so thank you. thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Blunt. Uh, Nancy, we do not see Ms. Blunt. Okay, thank you. Um, following Ms. Blunt, April Zenos. Mr. McNeese, do you see Ms. Zenos? Yes, yeah, she's in. If she'll join audio, I think she'll be able to speak.
Ms. Zenos, if you would click off, um, click that microphone icon, please. Okay. I, um, let me see. Um, Tim, can you offer any any support or can you remove? Oh, it looks like we have someone joining right now. Madam Chair, this is Jason Golden. If, if I may, I'm looking at Ms. Zenos and it does not show she's on mute. So there is apparently some additional audio problem. Okay. Given that, we will move to the next speaker and then we'll see if we can come back to her and uh, Mr. McNeese or anyone else from staff, if you can try to help with that, it would be much appreciated. Our next speaker is Rebecca Parker. Yes, Rebecca Parker. I, um, my name's Rebecca Parker and I have three children, each at a different level of WCS schools, elementary, middle and high school. I've been a WCS parent for 11 years, and I would like to speak for a minute about the protocols for next school year. Um, based upon the declining cases and the availability of the back vaccine, I think it is time. Excuse me. Uh, Ms. Zenos, we're going to, we'll hear from you next. Uh, Ms. Parker is speaking now. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, I think it's time that the school system exit this pandemic mentality. Um, the first thing I think that should be done is we should make masks optional next year for students and staff. Uh, the facts do not support the emphasis that's being placed on masks, especially at the middle and high school levels. Um, I feel like teachers, it's a distraction for them and they're actually participating in behavior that's unbecoming. I've had incidents with my middle and high schoolers involving teachers that were um, one yelling through a microphone in the hall. I'm sorry, not a microphone, a megaphone in the hallway. And then another time my other child was actually pulled by the backpack over a mask issue. I think that this is a distraction and it's a lightning rod of controversy. And I just don't think that um, the facts support the mask wearing. And it's also a symbol of fear. The next thing I'm hoping that you will consider is um, the quarantining, hoping that that can be an option. I know we've all gotten the dreaded lice letter in the past. And um, I think a shift to maybe moving to where we find out that way about COVID, that you've been exposed, but it does not result in healthy children staying home and not being able to learn in the environment that was chosen by their parents for them to learn. Um, I'd really like to know how many students that you quarantined were tested positive from COVID. Um, from what I understand, it's statistically insignificant. So I think it's time that the quarantining be an option, but not mandatory and keeping healthy students at home. And the last Ten thing- seconds, I would... 10 seconds, ma'am. 10 seconds, ma'am. Oh, yes. I hope we can return to a normal school year. I hope things like field trips, lunches in the cafeteria, and lunches with your parents, and consistency across the schools will be considered next year. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is April Zenos, uh, Ms. Zenos, if you'll come off mute. Thank Hi, you. can you see and hear me? Yes. Okay, so thanks for letting me speak today. Um, I have two kids. One is a fourth grader at Perry Creek, and the other one is a kindergartner at Perry Creek. And I just wanted to say I agree with many of the comments already about wanting to know what next year um, encompasses in terms of are there going to be restrictions? Are we going to still have to do the masks? And is everything going to be like it was this year? And I agree with that other mom that said, I didn't think it was right that we had to sign up and pick virtual versus online or in person, I mean, before we really knew what's going to happen. Um, and my daughters have been having a hard time just being so isolated and everything with all the fear. And I wanted to hope that next year, we can go back to being able to play on the playground like we were with all the classes and not just some of the classes or some of the equipment and being able to leave the room where their homeroom is and actually go to the art room 
for art class special music special instead of everyone coming to them and them staying in that seat the entire day. Um, and also making masks optional for people that are comfortable not wearing it or having their kids not wear it. And people, um, all the vaccines are now available to the teachers, I thought. So I was hoping by the summer, um, why, what would the point still be of having all these restrictions um, and allowing parents to come in and eat lunch with their kid in the cafeteria is also important, special for the little ones. Um, and so just basically like what they said, going back to normal. Um, and then also the flex days, I kind of don't feel like they're that educational for my kids. My fourth grader does not like them and wishes she was there at school with her friends, not at home on the computer. Um, so I think that, I think that was all the things. So thanks again for letting us um, share our comments with you. I'm told board members that uh, Ms. Blunt had lost her connection. She was here for her time to speak. So we'll go back to her now, uh, Sharon Blunt. And she has had problems again, so she's back out now. Okay, all right. Moving on, Amanda Ray. I don't see Amanda Ray. Let's move on to Amanda White. Okay. Amanda White. Ms. White. She's not showing that she has audio. Okay. All right. Let me make a star there. Um, the next speaker is Shanara Williamson. Good, good evening. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for taking time to hear my comments tonight. Um, my name is Shanara Williamson. My three daughters are currently ages 19, 21, and 23. They all attended Williamson County Public Schools in elementary school. Um, and I'm really thankful that you all have made the decision to hire a trained professional um, to provide diversity, equity, and inclusion training for teachers. Uh, this is important work if we're gonna prepare our kids for the world that they will one day lead. Our youngest daughter um, had a first grade teacher who had pretty low expectations of her, I would say. Um, I was present in the classroom weekly as the room mom, and I observed ways that implicit bias affected my child. Um, so much so that by the time the end of that first grade year happened, I made the decision to homeschool her in second grade. There were things that I wanted to do to shore up um, her confidence in reading and specifically. Um, what I realized is that most parents are not able to see what's happening in the classroom in real time in the way that I was, and they're not able to intervene in the ways that I had the ability to do. So we need our teachers and other staff members to be trained, ready to handle a variety of situations. Education is one of the systems in America, I think it's most affected by bias and the results can harm everyone involved, not just little um, children of color, but also others who see the way that that interaction happens. I hope that you see the value in the hard work um, that you've started. And my goal tonight is just to ask that you not shortcut this work, but please continue to fund the DEI consultant that um, has started the school year. And I would hope that you would fund it past the school year so that Williamson County Schools can have the full benefit of the expertise that this consultant provides. Um, this is just one mom's opinion and concerns. And thank you so much for having me. Our next speaker, we're going to go back to Sharon Blunt, Ms. Blunt. Ms. Blunt. Okay, we'll move on to the next speaker, Kelly Hendry. Ms. Hendry? She's joining. Okay. Looks like a slow, I can see the Sharon, happening. Sharon is back. Um, Madam Chair. 
Sharon, Ms. Blunt. Ms. Blunt, can you come off mute, please? How about now? Yes, we can hear you, Ms. Blunt. Thank you. Ms. I am so sorry. That's okay. I'm sorry for the difficulty. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I've requested my time to speak tonight as a concerned mother of three. Um, okay, thank you. Um, um, <clears throat> Miss Blunt, I think we've lost audio again. I am so sorry. I'm not sure. We can hear you again. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm calling to, to, to give my two cents about the mask mandates. I want to piggyback on what the other mothers have stated. And what about now? We can hear you again. Yes. And it looks like we've lost you again. I'm going to go to Kelly Hendry now, and then um, we'll see if we can get back to you, Ms. Blunt. Ms. Hendry, if you'll please come off mute. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So I'm Kelly Hendry. First, I just wanted to start off and thank my board member, Dan Cash, um, for listening, responding to my emails and my calls and being a strong voice uh, for District 2 and Williamson County School families. I have three points. First, um, masks. I'm asking that these be optional for the remainder of this school year. So yes, the last nine weeks and all of next school year, 2021 to 2022. Two, seniors. I have a senior this year. Um, it's been um, quite the year for this graduating class. I, um, the graduations are outside on the football field in two months. Therefore, they're outside. They're not inside. We've seen active case numbers continue to steadily decline. Um, as it continues to get warmer, we're going to continue to see that. Right now, they are limited to four tickets per family, per student. Um, so... I feel like we either don't need to limit the tickets or we need to allot each student more tickets um, as they can spread out. It's outside. It's a, it's a large venue. I, I've, I've spoken to quite a few families that have a large family and one parent is not going to be able to go or a sibling is going to, or siblings will miss uh, graduation because of this. I actually have a graduate uh, from the class of 2018 who graduated on the football field at Independence and there were no limited tickets and there was plenty of room to spread out um, and do it safely. Um, so I'm asking for either more tickets or don't even limit the tickets. Um, my daughter's only set of living grandparents are devastated that they don't get to celebrate her graduation in person. I mean, it's been a challenging year for the class of 2021, and they've missed a lot of fun memories. Uh, my, daughter's seconds, my daughter's actually in three choirs at her high school, and she's only been allotted two tickets for those choir concerts. So my parents have missed out on that. Um, I know basketball parents were allotted uh, four tickets per student athlete, and that's inside as well. So... Um, my parents have missed out on her solos in her choir concerts, and now they're going to miss out on her graduation. So, ma'am, two minutes. Thank you, Ms. Henry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Amanda White. Ms. White? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I have a seventh grader at Woodland Middle and a fifth grader at Clovercroft Elementary. Um, 
I am here just asking for a normal 2021, 2022 school year on their behalf, on many other children's behalf. Um, I'm asking for masks off or masks optional for those who feel they need it. Um, and I would actually love for that to happen for the, the last nine weeks of the school year. Um, I'm asking for the contact tracing quarantine guidelines to, to change. Um, my child was part of the, the contact tracing quarantine. I saw firsthand, I know firsthand, it's not just a statistic you read, uh, an article you read. I have a child that went through it. It is not healthy. Some children are okay and some children don't thrive that way. And some people definitely do not thrive in that position. Healthy as a horse, missing the last sports games of the year, um, missing out on making friends in a new school year. I'd like to advocate for getting back to lockers and cubbies. Um, the rite of passage to middle school is a locker. It's everyone's joy entering sixth grade. Uh, also, I would like for them to stop carrying the heavy backpacks and be able to use the lockers and cubbies. Lunch in the cafeteria so they can see each other's smiling faces and hear laughter and just have that small time together, lunch and recess, just to let loose and be kids. Um, this is as serious as hearing the words, what is the point to this life? I don't want to do this anymore. Um, it's not just shuffle along, come on, kids are resilient. Some kids are not resilient. Um, it's got to end this full-blown production of the opposite of normalcy. We've got to get these kids back to normal and consistent. Um, Ten seconds, ma'am. Yes. Let's stop stripping the joys of these children, give it back to them, and let them thrive. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Karen Hensley. Hi, I'm Karen Hensley. Um, I think I'm District 6 with Jen Apria, um, but I could be wrong on the number. Um, I have three children in Williamson County Schools. Um, one is a fourth grader in, at Jordan Elementary, one is a seventh grader at Sunset Middle, and one is a 10th grader at Ravenwood High School. And I'm specifically, while I have, I agree with all these ladies, my biggest issue, if I had to pick one, would be quarantines. Um, my oldest was quarantined after missing a ton of school because of other medical issues she had. And the quarantine piggybacked onto that just about threw our entire family over the edge. Um, as much as I don't feel that the schools are equipped to, to provide that bridge, that gap for um, continuing education, she both when she was sick and when she was healthy and quarantined, she was doing mostly self-teaching. Um, I saw the ups and downs and the, it, it, it's very frustrating from a parent's standpoint because you're trying to help your kid and there's, I felt very powerless. I, the, the question I have is, have we weighed, have we looked at the numbers of kids that have been quarantined who is actually tested positive of the, from that contact tracing and who has had symptoms? What are the, what do those numbers look like? And have we looked at the consequences of the quarantining and, and compared that to the data of a COVID, which is not taking down kids, the teachers are vaccinated. Um, I, you know, I just struggle with why are we doing this? Are we doing this because it looks good on paper? Are we doing this because we just don't know what we, what else to do? Um, I, I just, I very much both as a healthcare provider, I'm a nurse and as a mom, I strongly disagree with it. And I'm asking you to really look at the data and really look at the consequences of quarantining these healthy kids. And, um, and- 10, and 10 seconds, ma'am. Thank you. We're going to go back to Ms. Blunt now. Sharon Blunt. You can come off mute, Ms. Blunt. 
Okay, I, third, yeah. six times the charm. I am so sorry about that. Um, I've written down a few words and I'm really wanting to piggyback off of the mothers who've spoken about masks. And I have a few other items to add. Um, I am a very concerned mother of three. Masks are both harmful mentally, physically, and emotionally. Each of my children have had unique challenges with the mask mandates. And here are just a few personal examples of emotional issues that we've had. We've experienced sadness, not wanting to go to school, receiving minors for not wearing the mask properly. One of my children, she, expressed, she has undue stress throughout the school day for not wanting to get into trouble and disappoint her teachers when she needs an unscheduled mask break. My children have been very unmotivated to participate in after school activities because wearing a mask all day and breathing in your own carbon dioxide is exhausting and it leaves them un unmotivated. Some physical issues that we have faced are headaches, exhaustion, mask acne, which is terrible for middle schoolers. I have two middle schoolers. Um, some additional issues that I'm concerned with that will happen to our children at some point in time, if this is not alleviated, some of them are bacterial bronchial, bronchial and lung infections, gum and tongue candida, which is already being reported, suppressed immune systems, suicide and or attempted suicide. All of these things um, you can look up and they're all factual and there've been several articles written about them. Mask wearing should be a personal choice, not a mandate. It's harming our children in ways we won't know until later in their development. So I'm begging you to remove it. And uh, finally, I think other, other moms have mentioned this, but the CDC has stated multiple times, children are not super spreaders. They have very little reaction, if any, to this virus. I just am believing and hoping that you will remove all COVID restrictions. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Danielle McClendon. Hi there. Thank you for giving me time tonight. Um, I have two things that I want to talk about tonight. I am um, in district, district two. I have four children who will attend Thompson Station Elementary School next year. Um, and we've been there for three years already. Um, I have to say I am um, I'm excited about the diversity team coming in. I think that it can be a great thing with everything going on in the world. I as a, a parent of these four boys though, I would like to ask that um, that we as parents can see this curriculum before it comes out. Um, I would like to know is critical race, theory is will that be included um, just as an example and I, I'm just asking because there are so many different aspects of diversity so I want to make sure I approve of what my child is actually seeing before I expose them to that so I can make the proper decision for my own children as to where I would like to place them in in school um, so I, I would ask for that. And my second topic is our flex days. I just ask that we've been in, we've had a full week of school for two weeks since Christmas, and this is affecting our children. Kids are missing out at the high school level on, um, say they're, they're just skipping over algebra, going straight to geometry, geometry, because there's not enough time, um, the young kids, my two little kindergartners get on Zoom for 10 minutes and that's all they do all day. And then there are also children out there who have parents that both work, which I and my husband do work or a single parent who can't help them with these packets. So they're just not getting them done. These things are, are very sad. And now that the numbers are coming down, I just ask, please, that we take these flex days away. I so appreciate the teachers. Oh my goodness, so much at Thompson Station. Mr. Boer, Tina Aaron, um, all 10 of the seconds, ma'am. 
are have been amazing. And I thank you for that. And I get why you've needed the days. But going forward, I please ask that these are taken away. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robin Steenman. Hi, first time here. I'm District 12. Um, I hear you on the mask and the social distancing. I have to say that my daughter's actually been going to a private school with no social distancing and no masks for the entirety of the year with no shutdown days. And we've had zero COVID cases. So that could be a data point for you guys. But I have a kindergartner and I have a four-year-old and a five-month-old. And my main concern is the adoption of diversity, equity, and inclusion to include the 1619 project, critical race training, intersectionality. Um, California is presenting ESMC, which is an ethnic studies model curriculum. And that will be rolled out at the end of this month. And it's going to be paraded as a blueprint for the rest of the country. And trauma-based pedagogy, which actually teaches kids with via emotional trauma. Um, my point is, I know you guys have started down this path, and if you give them an inch, if you give one inch to this kind of teaching, then you're going to subject yourself to the whole spectrum. It's just going to keep continuing to slide. And where does it stop? Examples in Virginia, there's been blacklisting of parents for speaking out in Philadelphia and an elementary school forced fifth graders to celebrate black communism and host a black power rally. In Wake County Public Schools, North Carolina, parents, according to teachers, should be considered an impediment to social justice. In Arizona, they provided an equity toolkit that painted babies are racist at three months old. In Ohio, I have yet to find out the school district, but CRT, critical race training theory, had to be removed from the curriculum because the students were literally turning on each other. In uh, William Clark in Las Vegas, a high schooler filed suit against his high school for attempting to force him to label himself as an oppressor when he has a white father and a black mother. Um, 10 on. seconds, ma'am. In New York City, the eight white identities, and in California, the list is too long to, to read. So I wanna know what the plan is and is it safe for our kids? Because once you start down this slope, you're, you're gonna slide the whole way down. Our next speaker is Allison Anderson. Ms. Anderson, if you'll please come off mute. Ms. Anderson, can you hear me? Uh, Ms. Anderson, I believe you're still on mute. Mr. McKnight, we seem to be having some audio issues with Ms. Anderson. So I'll go on to Rachel Weaver right now and then we'll see if we can get Ms. Anderson back in. Hi, Ms. my name is Rachel Weaver. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, I think I'm in District 11. Um, I'm not quite sure. So I have four children in Williamson County Schools. I have a senior, a freshman, a sixth and fourth grader. We moved here in September from a different state with the sole purpose of resuming our in-person school. I followed the metrics over the summer that this district was put. Ms. Weaver. I'm sorry, we've lost your audio. Can you, let's see if we can hear you now. No, we've lost audio. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. I followed the metrics. Okay, these are the three things that I'd like to address tonight. The first thing is the choice to wear a mask in school. We're, we as parents take calculated risks every day when we send our kids to school. We sign many waivers and documents at the beginning of school. And when our kids make a school sports team that we assume risk and, and liability. I don't see any difference in the choice to have our child wear a mask and assume all liability and risk of sickness that may come with that. 
The second issue is the quarantine. My senior in high school was quarantined five times in the fall, and she has not even had so much as a sniffle in over a year. I know in the beginning, we didn't know a lot about the virus and we were all doing the best we could, but now we know a lot more. My senior daughter was told to go home for 14 days at a time with no instruction and then penalized with late assignments, which resulted in bad grades when she's a straight A student before. I, have to keep, I had to keep reminding myself that this was not her fault and she was sitting home learning from notes as a perfectly healthy kid. In my opinion, contact tracing and quarantines need to be lifted. The community spread is so low that it's not warranted anymore as a measure to control the virus, in my professional opinion. I'm not going to complain without um, trying to offer a proposed option for others that feel the same way. Would you as the board consider a simple waiver where parents were given the choice to assess the potential risk of attending school on mask and also assume any risk of exposure in order to be exempt from contact tracing at school? There is never going to be a 0% risk. So like everything else in life and moreover, what we are trying to teach our children at some point, you have to take a calculated risk. Finally, my last question is about graduation. Would the board please consider increasing the number of tickets for graduation since it's now outside? As of right now, with the limit of four tickets, my young children will not be able to see their sister graduate. Thank you for your time and consideration. And our final speaker for this evening is Allison Anderson. Ms. Anderson, your showing is on mute. Sorry. Now we can hear you. Yes. Okay, you can hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Allison Anderson. I live in District 2 with Dan Cash. I have a first grader at Thompson Station Elementary, a sixth grader at Thompson Station Middle, and a ninth grader at Summit High. I am a former kindergarten and special ed public school teacher. Um, I taught special ed across all grade levels, and I hold a master's degree in marriage and family counseling with many years of experience with children. During this COVID era, my single greatest concern has been the mental and emotional well-being of children and adolescents, not just in the here and now, but their well-being well into the future. Contrary to popular belief, suicide rates are not the highest in the cold, dark winter months or around Christmas or other holidays, but the highest suicide rates um, occur in the month of April, May, and June. And it's usually two to three times higher than suicide rates in December. We're quickly approaching those months. We know that COVID restrictions, quarantines, cancellation of extracurricular activities, and mask mandates contribute to these increases in mental health incidents among children and adolescents. I myself have a child who begs me to switch to online school simply because the mask causes so much anxiety and distracts them at school from focusing. My husband and I really struggle with knowing which, with deciding which learning environment would be best for this child simply because of, of mask mandates. Pediatric emergency room visits from um, April to October of 2020 um, were down significantly for injuries and illnesses. However, emergency room visits were significantly higher for mental health incidents. Um, yeah. They increased as much as around 25% for ages 5 through 11. So even elementary schoolers are seeing an increase. And um, over 30% for ages 12 and 17. And then ages 18 and up, young adults is just astronomical. Some areas of the country have seen more than triple the amount of mental health incidences. In light of this data and due to the fact that we're entering into the highest risk season for suicidal behavior. I hope you all consider getting our students' lives back to normal, not for the next year, but as soon as possible. Thank you. That concludes our public comment for this evening. We'll now move on to the approval of tonight's meeting agenda. Do we have a motion to approve? Consider getting our students' lives back. Motion to approve. Motion to approve from Mr. I think it was Mr. Mitchell. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Second from Mr. Welch. Is there any discussion?
I see no hands raised. If not, then let's move to a roll call vote, Ms. Glenn. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Lydia Glenn. Angela Durham. Angela Durham, yes. Dan Cash. Mr. Cash. Dan Cash, yes. Elliot Mitchell. Elliot Mitchell, yes. Brad Fiscus. Brad Fiscus, yes. Jenna Priya. Yes. Jay Galbraith. Jay Galbraith, yes. Sheila Cleveland. Sheila Cleveland, yes. Candy Emerson. Candy Emerson, yes. Rick Wimberly. Rick Wimberly, yes. Eric Welch. Eric Welch, yes. Casey Hall. Casey Hall, uh, yes. Nancy Garrett. Nancy Garrett, yes. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no, motion passes. Thank you, board members. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve? Rick Wimberly moved to approve. Mr. Wimberly makes the motion. Do we have a second? Elliot Mitchell seconds. Mr. Mitchell seconds. Is there any discussion? I see no hands raised. We can move to a vote, Ms. Glenn. Angela Durham. Angela Durham, yes. Dan Cash. Dan Cash, yes. Elliot Mitchell. Elliot Mitchell, yes. Brad Fiscus. Brad Fiscus, yes. Jenna Priya. Jenna Priya, yes. Jay Galbraith. Jay Galbraith, yes. Sheila Cleveland. Sheila Cleveland, yes. Candy Emerson. Andy Emerson, yes. Rick Wimberly. Rick Wimberly, yes. Eric Welch. Eric Welch, yes. Paul. Casey Ohio, yes. Nancy Garrett. Nancy Garrett, yes. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no, motion passes. Board members, with the approval of that consent agenda, you've approved the February 15th, 2021 school board meeting minutes and also the Franklin High School replacement of gymnasium floor and revised logo on the multi-purpose field. Our next item is communications to the board. And I'll turn this over to our superintendent, Mr. Jason Golden, Mr. Golden. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you board members uh, for being here tonight. Uh, you all know that we just finished our spring break and uh, I'm, I'm so excited that we are in the fourth quarter. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, yeah, this has been a pretty incredible year so far. And I will tell you, I'm just so impressed with the skill of our teachers and the, the efforts of our students through this time. And you guys know we're in a pandemic. Uh, and it's really been impressive to, to see what um, our folks are doing. Uh, I will tell you that uh, I, I still hear from time to time from families moving into the district that they've, they've moved here from an area where some of, their, for some of their children still haven't been in school, actually on campus uh, through the year. Um, and I'm really proud of uh, what our staff has done uh, through this year in, in pushing, pushing, pushing those efforts uh, to, to do what we could to keep our students on campus. It hasn't been perfect. Uh, we've had some times where we haven't been able to be on campus, but, uh, but, the, but the effort uh, has been there and I think it's been worth it so far. Um, as you all know, especially this year, it seems like things change uh, daily. Uh, since our work session, the last Thursday before spring break, uh, we have had some changes uh, already and I wanna give you an update on those. I'm gonna keep this fairly brief, especially compared to our work session uh, and, uh, and, and tell you a little bit of what you heard uh, through some through some media sources, the, the uh, CDC uh, did uh, receive some research related to social distancing, and we mentioned to you at the work session that that it that it occurred, but there have been no changes yet from the CDC or the state health department. Friday afternoon, uh, last official day of spring break, at around four o'clock, uh, Gary Anderson received an email from the state on what they call the listserv 
uh, where they, they published uh, some detail from the health department uh, regarding some changes. I wanna give you a brief uh, report on those changes that they are making to their processes. Uh, and it's gonna be a nutshell, it won't be the detail. Um, but uh, but um, the basics of what we have learned from them is that at the elementary level, the six foot social distancing um, standard is being reduced to three feet if students are wearing masks. Uh, and at the middle and high school level, it's the same standard based on whether a community transmission rate is at what they call low or I think moderate, uh, not high. And so they have reduced uh, in, in many circumstances that, that standard of six feet, 15 minutes that we've heard for the last few months. And you all may remember even prior to that, it was six feet, 10 minutes. And so there's been another change. Um, but we're excited about that. Um, Mr. Anderson and, and uh, his staff met today with a health department, with a local health department to talk about the, uh, the implementation of that state standard and, and what that means. Uh, and I want you to know, of course, they just had their first meeting today and, and, and uh, Gary is available if you have any questions, but I want you to know some of the specifics about what we're gonna be working on over the next few days. This is, I think, relevant to what um, some of the questions you've actually received from some of our, some of our uh, great parents er earlier today. Um, we are going to be looking at how we can improve elementary mobility in our buildings. Um, you, you all know that many of our schools uh, have, been, have, have kept those classes together at the elementary level. We believe that with this change, especially at the elementary level, there's some potential for us to make some changes uh, this quarter. Uh, with that mobility. And so I'll give you a couple of, of specific things we're gonna look at. Actually moving to an art classroom, moving to, moving to music. Um, some, of our, some of our schools have not physically been in the cafeteria based on student numbers and capacity in the cafeterias. We're gonna go back and review those. Uh, and that's gonna be some work over these next few days to see how we can take that next step uh, um, towards, um, towards operating within the CDC and health department guidelines uh, safely and still give as much uh, flexibility and freedom to our students as we can. At the secondary level, we're going, we're going to uh, um, analyze and see what we can do uh, to, to address potential change in our outdoor activities. Uh, and there's actually a reference in the CDC, well, actually in the State Department, state health department guidelines related to um, outdoor activities with a strong encouragement to do what you can outside. Uh, and we're going to evaluate um, what we can do with, uh, with attendance and crowds at graduation ceremonies, because as, as you know, um, we've moved those uh, weather permitting uh, to, to outside um, based on what we know um, related to those, the, the, uh, the facilities that we were going to, we have historically been using and their need to host other things or restrictions internally where we could not um, use those facilities. We're gonna evaluate that, um, the extent to which we can expand um, um, attendance uh, based, on, based on those new guidelines. Spring sports, likewise. And so we're very excited that this, um, that this messaging we received from the state health department on Friday afternoon has opened up some doors for us to take those next steps uh, towards, uh, towards um, again, safely um, moderating our guidelines. You also know that after our board work session a week and a half ago, um, we did make the decision to eliminate our temperature checks. Uh, and I wanna thank those board members. Um, I know many of you spoke to us about that. Um, and, um, and convinced us to do some data collection and some research. Uh, and, and based on that, and based on what we learned uh, from, from that and from, from, our, um, from our individual school communities, uh, it was time. And so thank you for that. Uh, I will tell you that uh, just as a reminder, the county government is requiring temperature checks at, at, the, uh, at their building still. That includes our central office. Likewise, TWSWA is still requiring temperature set checks. So what we're talking about is as, as students enter the building in the mornings, but there may still be some events and there will still be some events where that is required because we're, we're governed by uh, other entities. Uh, next thing I wanna um, mention to you is related to those specific guidelines from the state health department, 
they really re-emphasized uh, the continued need for masks. Uh, and uh, we talked, uh, we talked you know, a week and a half ago at our work session about our projections for masks and those critical dates that we were, that we were seeing uh, coming up you know, with about you know, a week to two weeks after a, a, a long break. And then um, with our students who were online coming onto campus to take uh, their TCAP, T and ready test and end of course test because the state is requiring that on campus. Um, but what I've seen from the information from the state health department uh, that they published on Friday afternoon is realistically, I have to project that more likely than not, we will be um, wearing masks. Uh, we'll still be requiring masks per our return to school plan that you all approved back in July um, through, through the end of the school year. But as we've discussed also, if there's a change um, from them in these next eight or nine weeks, uh, then, then that is that is still a possibility. But I just think I need to be frank that I just, uh, given that reemphasis uh, from the CDC, uh, that, that I think that's extremely unlikely. And the CDC still is recommending that schools require those masks. And again, I want to emphasize uh, that reduction in the social distancing standard is dependent on all those participants actually wearing masks. So not only does it reemphasize that, that, that need from those health authorities, uh, it, it confirms um, the plan that you all approved that we're at um, um, for this, for this um, school year. I will tell you also, I think it's extremely important um, for us to reemphasize as clearly as I can that we will continue to follow the CDC and state health department guidelines uh, and listen to those health authorities um, uh, as, as much as we can. Um, and and that, that includes this year uh, um, plus next year. Um, right now, you all have approved the plan for, for this year. I'm optimistic about next year. We talked about that at the, at the uh, board work session, and I know that we all have different opinions on that. One of the reasons I'm optimistic is because we do see changes uh, as, uh, as, uh, as the health authorities um, uh, determine that changes are appropriate. Another uh, item that makes me optimistic is what we're hearing at the federal level about the distribution of vaccines. Um, there's a lot of talk about um, phrase, phraseology like herd immunity and those kinds of phrases that we almost never hear and almost never heard until, until this event. Um, but I will tell you at this stage, as we sit here in late March, um, I can't predict the future. Um, I can be optimistic uh, but I, but what I can tell you is that my intent and my plan is to follow our health authorities' guidelines uh, as much as we can, uh, with a goal that we've had throughout the school year of keeping students on campus. Um, so that's that's a really significant change for us that we'll be working on over these next uh, these next few days. As soon as we are able to make some changes uh, based on that and do do our work internally. Uh, to figure out what we can do. Uh, we'll, of course, communicate that with you and communicate that with our families. Uh, but we're excited about where we are um, with the future. Um, next thing I, I want to specifically address is fostering healthy solutions. You all know we've made it a point to talk about that as much as we could uh, at our meetings. And I very much appreciate what um, we heard from um, members of the public in public comment uh, uh, today. Uh, and it really does, what we heard from just a few people really does reflect a lot of what I've heard in the community. I've heard from some of our young alumni, and you all know this, uh, that there were times in their careers where they were the victims of discriminatory behavior and they were either uncomfortable reporting it or they didn't see a result. Uh, on the other side, we have heard from folks that are very concerned about um, curriculum and what they're seeing at, at a national level. And I wanna make sure that we reemphasize what we've talked about, uh, that uh, about what uh, Fostering Healthy Solutions is doing for us and what they are not. They are helping us uh, do a better job of making and helping our, our students, all our students uh, feel safe in the environment uh, that they're in when we're serving them uh, at school. Uh, all students feeling safe uh, is, is very important to us. And what we've learned over this past year plus 
is uh, that many of our young alumni and current students and parents have told us there were times when they weren't comfortable reporting that. I am so gratified that we're at a point uh, here in this community that they are comfortable now telling us that because just a few years ago, that was a rarity in my experience. Uh, and so I think that's a step forward and you all making the decision to bring in Fostering Healthy Solutions is, 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 is another step in that direction. Um, they're gonna review our policies. They're going to help us set goals and action steps to help our students be more comfortable and be safer in our, in our schools. They are not creating curriculum for us. Uh, they are consulting with us and helping us walk on this journey uh, to improve how we serve our students. I will also tell you that we have a small frequently asked questions section in our strategic planning webpage uh, that addresses uh, those questions. And so I would always invite folks to, to go to that, go to strategic planning. Uh, and on the right hand side, um, there are a handful of questions that basically reiterate uh, what I just talked about. Uh, we'll continue to update those um, as questions arise. And uh, I know that Ms. Garrett is gonna actually talk to you at least briefly about some scheduling uh, issues related to that. So that is my um, brief update uh, from a superintendent's perspective. Uh, we're really uh, excited about where we are this fourth quarter. Uh, we see growth and change uh, on the horizon. Uh, um, we're not out, uh, out of the woods yet. Um, but, uh, but we're making some progress on the, on the COVID front uh, and on something that I think is going to be a very long-term um, growth um, journey for us with um, how we serve uh, our diverse student body. So, Madam Chair, of course, I'm open to any questions that, they, that, that uh, anyone may have. Madam Chair, you're on mute. Thank you. Let's stay ahead of myself there. Board members, if you have any questions, would you please raise your hand in the chat? Take a quick scroll here. Uh, Mr. Galbraith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Jason, a few, a few questions. Um, sorry, Jay Galbraith here, District 6. Um, with the with the three foot rule versus the th versus the old six foot rule, what was the old rule as defined by the CDC? The the old number one. I'm going to invite Gary to 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 make sure I'm correct. It, the the old rule was six feet fifteen minutes um, constituted. That was the minimum baseline that constituted a close contact, which would um, trigger the health department making a quarantine decision. That was a threshold. I will tell you also, we, we learned from them that, uh, that there were also times where they would quarantine even if someone did not meet that threshold based on the details of their investigation. Gary? Uh, yes, sir, that's correct. They, they changed it from six feet, 15 minutes to six feet, 15 minutes over 24 hour period. So it didn't have to be all at one time of 15 minutes. It can be over an exposure period of, of 24 hours. So, so what actually changes with this, with this three foot rule? Well, according to the CDC documents and the information that the, uh, that the health department, the state health department is following, and they then send it down to the regional and the regional sends it to the local health department what that all entails is they are still doing close contact based on the six foot uh, parameter. But even though the distance, even though they're saying you can get closer, they're still going to go through the six foot uh, uh, distance as their baseline to determine close contact. So, um, so, this, so this guidance is really more of, of what's deemed to be, to be a safe distance to be in school, right? So the CDC prior said that a six foot distance was, was required. Six foot distance was required to, uh, and it had to be over six foot away from a- But I'm not, it's not talking about quarantine. It's talking about just a safe distance to have school. Uh, they're saying you can, you can be three feet apart. So if you don't, if you're, if you're putting distance and quarantine don't come in play together on this three, the distance doesn't doesn't play the same as the quarantine. Uh, that's that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to point out. So the old 
the old CDC guidance was that that a safe distance was six feet. They they did not support us the, us having school the way we were having school. We made a we made a determination that that we we had to weigh going hybrid or having less than 100% capacity with having 100% capacity and being as distance as possible, but less than probably less than six foot apart. Did we make that determination? We made the determination. Uh, if you all think back to our discussion in, you know, in July, we made the determination based on their recommendations uh, that, that, well, two things. One, they, you know, the, the mask issue that, but second, in this particular context, they said to be, to maintain social distancing um, when possible. And what we determined and we're very clear with folks over the summer is it's not possible for us to have everyone on campus uh, and be that six feet. Um, um, if, at the time it was, it was 10 minutes. Um, so we were going to do what we could within that range, but knowing that it wasn't, wasn't feasible to do that all the time. Okay. Uh, well, so, so to your point, yeah, the, the guidelines were, if feasible, do it. We said it's not feasible. Okay. So, um, so with respect to the temperature checks, um, what guidance were we following when we chose to continue the temperature checks for three months after the CDC said that they were no longer warranted? Well, the original, the original uh, CDC guidelines were, were to do it. And, and you all may recall that the state bought hundreds of thermometers for districts across the, 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 uh, the state. Uh, when, when that change was made, the, uh, the CDC um, included in that a recommendation that parents take their children's temperatures um, in the mornings. Uh, we were already set up for it. Uh, locally, it was, it was feasible. The county had, uh, it, you know, was still doing it. It was, was doing it and is still doing it at their buildings. Uh, we determined that because we had it in place uh, and, and, uh, and it was feasible and doable, that it still made sense for us to do that rather than put that expectation on our parents. And, but you said the reason that you, that you discontinued that was, was largely in part, um, was largely due to the, to the data that we collected to say, that, that show that that was not a worthwhile effort. That, that, yeah, that's, that's right. That, that it was, that there was no need for that um, uh, based on, based on the data that we've learned. So we have the ability to collect data and make decisions um, irrespective of the CDC. We do, we've done it, we've done it with, we've done it with the three foot rule or the six foot rule. We made a determination that, that we couldn't, we couldn't accommodate six feet, but having kids in school was better than not having them in school. Um, and then we determined based on our uh, collection of data that, that the temperature checks were no longer needed. That's right. The CDC recommendations for, for uh, um, close contact for proximity was if feasible. We determined it wasn't feasible uh, to, to do what they recommended and made, decision, made the decision to, to have students on campus, even though it wasn't feasible. Uh, and we did, um, as, as you point out, continue the temperature checks beyond the time that they were actually recommending um, schools check. So when, so do we, don't we have enough data um, over, over the course of time, over a half a million quarantines or so, or quarantine days to, to determine that, that the transmission rates of um, of these quarantine students is, I mean, I've, I've heard anywhere from one and a half to 3%, something like that. Um, like, don't we have the ability to, to know, to know that, that, that especially now that the CDC is saying that three, um, that three feet is adequate, um, you know, can we, how, how do we implement a, a three foot limit, um, for quarantines, because that would, um, that by, I mean, with, with the combination of our teachers, not, not quarantining or our vaccinated teachers, not causing our, our, our healthy students not to quarantine, um, by virtue of their vaccination. And then the, the three foot rule, we would, we would eliminate, I mean, 
what do you what would you think? Eighty plus, ninety plus percent of our quarantines. Mr. Gold, G G yes, ma'am. If I can make a quick point of clarification here, um, I just I just want to remind the board that um, that these guidelines have just been received, and there's a lot of conversation going on right now with the health department. I know that the staff has had several meetings today about, you know. How, how can we apply these new guidelines? What do these new guidelines really mean? So I just want to make sure that we all realize that, you know, staff may not be able to answer all of the questions that we have for them tonight. And so um, Jason and staff, I just want to make sure that, that um, as always, you feel comfortable to say, I don't know the answer to that right at this time because we got these guidelines at four o'clock and we've been looking at them all day, but we will, we will inform the board and the public when we can. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I don't know that I can answer the 80% the, the question that Mr. Galbraith asked, but what I can tell you is, is that what we're exploring is, is the, the potential increased input that we'll, that we'll have when we speak to the health department about quarantine decisions um, with what we're doing. Uh, and so my hope is, and what we're exploring with them, is that our input in individual quarantine cases may be more significant. Uh, I think the next few weeks will tell, um, you know, based on that, based on that, um, that reduction from the CDC. Uh, I don't know if Gary has the ability to answer the, the statistical question. It's Gary Anderson, I, I wouldn't know about what percentage to put on it, something like that. So no, I don't have I don't have a good answer for that right now. Well, the, I mean, the three foot, the three foot change is worthless. We haven't, it's, it's completely what we've been doing all along. And so if we don't, if we don't work with, whether we work with the health department or without the health department, if we, if we don't stop quarantining people for, um, that are where, where the, um, where the distance is, is less is more than three feet apart and less than six feet apart, then we're going to continue. Like we, the board asked you to do something to um, to limit the number of quarantines, and you've you've continued to say that working with the health department is um, is reducing the number of quarantines, and that's just not true now. So we have the ability to make our own decision on whether students are allowed in school or not. Only the, only the health department can send that letter that gives the health department backed endorse um, order to stay home by order of law. But we don't have to do that. All we have to do is tell the student whether they can and can't come to school. And, and we can do that like one of the parents said with a life letter to tell them that someone in their, in their class within their vicinity was, was found to test positive. If you're asymptomatic and are comfortable with coming to school, then you can still do that. We have the ability to make that decision on our own, do we not? I'm not sure of your question, but let me tell you what we do have the ability to do. And, and I feel better about this change than I think you may, because you said this, this doesn't do any good. I, I disagree with that, in part because of where we are at this stage in timing. Um, I, my opinion and what we're working on is that we will have the ability to convince uh, our local health department based on, the, based on the safety measures that we're implementing uh, to, 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 to be... Um, less broad in uh, in their quarantine decisions as they quarantine uh, to your to your and, and, and we're early to, to Miss Garrett's point, um, but I haven't just looked at those on Friday and said this doesn't do us any good. I think it opens up another door for us to discuss with the local health authorities uh, to talk about what we're doing, to talk about some of those some of those numbers uh, like you've discussed and make and make different decisions on that. I think this is at this stage, um, a, a change that, that is encouraging, that deserves that exploration. Uh, as, as far as the, your question about, um, can, we, can we tell students that they, that they can come to school? Uh, you were right that the health department is the quarantining body that they tell someone they can't, uh, they can't come to school. Uh, as superintendent, 
um, when, when, uh, when a health authority has made a decision that someone needs to quarantine, um, it, I can't, uh, as, a, as an education professional, say, I know the health department has told you that, but come on anyway. No, I'm not, uh, I'm not, ask, I'm not asking the opposite. So okay. if, if you don't, if the health department doesn't know, right, if the health department has never told about the person, um, and then you have the authority to allow that student in school or not because of, because of having symptoms, either tested positive or having a fever or symptoms based on, based on your guidelines. You can refuse a student's ability to come to school and, and, and request that they be sent home. Okay. You I, know, I think I know what you're, I think I know what you're saying. And so and hopefully this answers this question. Um, when someone is sick, we take them to the nurse or to the office and say, you know, call a parent or a guardian and say, you need to come home and pick your child up. They're sick. Uh, um, we have not quarantined or told anyone you have to go home now because we think you were in a close contact. Uh, we haven't done that throughout this year. We have told people, hey, it's possible you may be. You may remember some of those early months. Uh, um, when, when the health department was there, but we haven't been telling anyone you have to go home because we think you were um, exposed to a positive case. That, that has been something that, that has been in the exclusive purview of the health department throughout. I do know that there have been school systems who have done that on their own, uh, but but we have we have not done that. Well, we, well, and we I'm not sure. To, if I think that answers. No, your question. That, so we have we have the ability to do that. So right right now our nurses are compiling. With our, with our assistant principals and probably other administrative staff, um, they're compiling this big old long sheet of data that we're handing over to the, to the health department. We could use that same sheet of data and, and determine who can and can't come to school. I just want to make sure that we're, we're legally, if, I, I'm, not, I'm not asking if you want to do that, but under, our legal authority allows us to do that. Could we tell someone we believe that you are um, a close contact and therefore you need to go home? Yes, we could do that. Right. We can't tell them that they can't go anywhere else by order of law, by order of the health department, only the health department. That's a quarantine. We're just telling them that they have to go home and can't come back for a certain number of days. But, right. And so and, and we and we can base that on what we all know based on our based on our data and based on what the CDC says that a three foot distance is a safe distance. Like regardless of whether they're changing the quarantine determination or not, we could base our decision whether to allow somebody into school based on that three foot distance instead of a six foot distance. Is that correct? We could do that. I think what you're saying is the same thing that I just answered, which is we could tell somebody we think you were a close contact and therefore you can't come to school. Yes, we can do that. I don't think that's a good idea. Um, but yes, we could. We could do that. Why do you not think? Why do you not think that's a good idea? Why, like our nurses, so so I try. To, I'll try to be as blunt as, as I can. Why would we overstep and make decisions without the health professionals doing it? Why would we, in essence? tell somebody to get out of the schools when the health department hasn't told them to. I just don't understand why we would do that for because, the same, uh, for the, for the same reason that, that, uh, that we don't, that, that we haven't been, uh, the, uh, that, that, we'll, that we follow the health authorities. I'm not prepared to say as an education professional that quarantine makes perfect sense. Uh, and you know that the legislature has from time to time in the last year or so ar argued this very question about putting that, um, putting that on schools. Um, if that passes and we're the decision maker, we know, we know we're it. We could do what you're saying, but I, I don't see the, the reason for doing more than the, than the health department does. Well, right. I'm not, I'm not saying to do more. I'm saying to follow a guideline that's different that follows the CDC guide. Like right, right now, the CDC guideline is contradictory, right? It's saying three feet is safe, but we're going to quarantine you up to six feet. Like so, we, we could if you if you set your if you set your desk three feet apart, then and you're sitting next to each other, it's safe, but we're still going to quarantine you. Like that doesn't make any sense. And we have the we have the intellect. Our nurses have the intellectual capacity to understand that that doesn't make any sense. And all it's doing, all we're 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 basically allowing the health department 
to determine our educational ability, right? So we're, we're allowing them to, to quarantine 20, 15, 20 people to ever, for every contact, even though a very, very small number of those ever test positive or shows any symptoms. And we know that by data. So why don't we, I mean, why can't we go back to the life warning and, and we notify the parents that they, that there is a, that there is a communicable disease found in their, um, in their classroom in close vicinity. If you have, if you have lice, if you have uh, any symptoms, please don't come to school. But if you don't, just consider it a warning and be on alert for the next two weeks to know that you might have been exposed to that. Now, Madam Chair, may I call a point of order here? Ms. Offbrooks, is that permissible? Yes, it is. Okay. Please so, so, so I, I guess my point of order is this, is, we, we do have an agenda to continue on and follow. And, and I believe Mr. Galbraith has had an opportunity to ask his questions to Mr. Golden per Mr. Golden's offer of answering questions. But I, uh, I guess I would make the point that it, it, I feel like it's that, that we're venturing down into an area of badgering and argument uh, as opposed to just asking questions. My, my point is, I think we, we want to remind us that we have an agenda of voting tonight on items as well. This is not strictly just a uh, work session. May I continue? So, um, Chairman Garrett, this is Dana Osbrooks. I do think it is an appropriate time at 8 o'clock. We've been going since 630 to take a break. I would appreciate a comfort break. Okay. We can take a break here and we'll, we'll come back in 10 minutes.
Mr. Welch and Mr. Mitchell. Labor at this point. We'll move ahead. Uh, we're back to Mr. Galbraith's questions and then following Mr. Galbraith, Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Wimberly. Uh, I believe some hands have gone down since the break. So we have Mr. Galbraith, then Mr. Mitchell, then Mr. Wimberly. Mr. Galbraith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Jay Galbraith, District 6. So, um, so Jason, um, I mean, listening to the parents, um, that spoke uh, a majority of them, uh, maybe 12 or 13, uh, they, they all wanted to understand the, the timing of the, of the registration deadline tomorrow. And um, with the, you know, having to have just a, a vague notion of, of the current plan for last year, uh, and I know that I guess it's your plan to, to keep with that same framework, um, but we are not the, I guess the board is not weighing in on that. We're just, we're just accepting that you're not making any changes for, for next year. Is there, um, I mean, is there a, is there anything that you can give them other than, other than waiting and letting the health department determine what we're going to do? Um, like, you know, right now, Right now it says zero cases is what we're gonna look like for no mask and, uh, and until then we're, it's mask and all the other restrictions until zero cases in the county. So what else can you give them besides we're gonna wait on the health department to, to be comfortable uh, with making their decision tomorrow? Well, first of all, thanks, thanks for that question. Um, and the framework uh, was for this year, for 2020-2021 uh, that, that you all approved. Uh, and it gave me the flexibility to make changes. Um, what I can tell you right now as, as superintendent, like I, like I said in my report, um, I intend to follow the, uh, the CDC and state health department guidelines. Um, I, I can't predict the future in five months, but what I can tell folks is that we're gonna make the best decisions we can for student safety, uh, follow, the, follow the guidelines with a goal of keeping students on campus. Um, and, and like we talked about at the work session, um, I'm optimistic because of those, those, uh, those items that I've seen, but I can't predict the future other than to say, we're going to do what we can do as education professionals to make sure students are safe based upon what the health authorities give us. So I, I guess, I mean, the suicide rates are, are, are up. Um, as we heard somebody say, the president of the APA is speaking out to return to normalcy as soon as possible for, for lots of reasons other than COVID, right? So the, the health department is giving us and the CDC is giving us guidance only for one little piece of the, of the puzzle, which is protecting us from COVID. Um, but at some point we have to let parents make decisions on how to protect their kids from everything else um, not related to COVID. And so the, the online program was was instituted to give parents a choice uh, so that we weren't forcing people to go to school when they didn't feel comfortable. Um, and so at winter, winter, so, so you're saying the, the, the parents choice is to is tonight is tomorrow. Their choice is to determine if they trust that the CDC uh, and is going to, um, is going to remove the mask mandate at some point. Um, or you're, you're sending two constituencies now to, to online programming. You're sending the students who are still scared of COVID because of their health condition or one of a family member. And now you're, you're going to, you're going to force the students right now to make a decision based on their estimation of whether, um, of whether the restrictions are going to be removed. 
let me let me if I can um, answer that uh, with a couple of a uh, couple of pieces. Number one, the decision is based on a semester, not a year. And I know that one of the parents had mentioned a, a full year, so I want to make sure that that's clear. Uh, second, um, as we talked about at the work session, ordinarily uh, these decisions um, related to enrollment and, and classes are made in January. We've pushed that schedule as far back as we possibly can. Um, but but finally. What I can offer everyone is, given that we've pushed this back as far as we can, um, we are going to make the best safety decisions we can for everyone with a goal of keeping students on campus. I can't predict the future. I can't make a declaration one way or the other. I just can't. Um, and and, uh, and, and, and I, I understand what you're saying and I respect it. Uh, um, and, but but what I what I can do is tell folks that we will follow the health department um, guidelines as best we can while keeping students on campus. Understand. So, but other other school districts, Murray County, uh, Rutherford is is up for a vote on whether or not they are going to um, allow masks for for next year. So it, it's something within our authority to do. We're not we're not beholden to to anyone to make this. This is a decision that we can make as a board, correct? Yes, sir. Quarant yeah, decisions. that's right. Quarantines so, are all- So um, I'm gonna, this Sorry, is Dana go Osbrooks. I'm gonna stop you there, uh, Superintendent Golden, because I wanna make sure I understand Mr. Galbraith's question. Can you state that again? Yeah, so there's a couple of counties have um, either have not required masks all, all year or are um, proposing to have votes for the from the board um, to determine if they are going to make mask optional or, or required um, next year. Um, and so I just wanted to understand if that's something that's within our authority to do. So I'm happy to have that conversation with you offline. Um, but generally, my answer is going to be yes, but I obviously want more specifics. Um, so feel free to contact me offline for that legal advice. That's Thank fine. you, Mr. Galbraith. That's fine. I appreciate that. Um, so so I guess, Jason, my, my last my last plea um, is and I know I know most of the people um, on here don't have kids in school. Um, and so I just want to give you and, and Miss Apriya made a, a great plea for uh, for her son. And I really do. Um, I really do appreciate that uh, that perspective. My perspective is coming from uh, coming from a senior who is waiting for this meeting to understand and having to make a decision um, because he cannot um, just mentally cannot, cannot do another semester like, um, like the last two. Um, and so we've got to make some tough choices in my household. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that everybody, everybody understands the, the difficult situation that, um, that we're putting parents in right now. But my question, Jason, is, if, if the health department is going to be um, so involved in setting policy for our public school system, um, then I would like to propose that, I would really like for you to propose to delay the, the registration deadline until we have a special session where we can invite officials from the state and local health department um, to, to discuss these things. Um, and I'm asking to do it fairly expeditiously. Um, but they're also public officials, and and I've only I think we've only had one opportunity to uh, to talk with any of the um, I think there was a Dr. Parrish came on to the county commission one time uh, I wasn't able to attend, but um, but these are public officials that are making public policy. Uh, we have to sit here and have public meetings and be subject to um, public public meetings and public scrutiny. Um, and I, I think that the least they could do is come and, uh, and answer some of these questions for us um, as far as to, to give our, our parents and students better understanding as far as what we can expect in the future. Ms. Garrett, if I may. Yes, please. Um, Mr. Galbraith, this is Dana Osbrooks. Again, um, great suggestion. Thank you for that comment. And um, that's something that we can discuss offline. I guess, with all due respect, I wanted to, I want to, I want to discuss, I, I want to make the make the statement publicly, um, and I'm fine to to have the conversation offline as to as to the, how we do that or if we can. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you, for, you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Gallagher. Our next speaker is Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Jason, my, my question is around what can we do uh, towards the question on graduation tickets? And uh, if we, if, if, um, um, can we revisit that, that for maximum rule possibly given the new guidance or given the fact that not all schools are the same and that, uh, uh, you know, and I guess I'll remind everybody the reason we're doing this outside is because the uh, um, facilities that we normally use are not available to us this year, uh, whether it be uh, Lipscomb, Belmont, or the uh, um, county, county agricultural facility. Um, so anyway, that would be my question. Uh, is there an opportunity to revisit that limit? Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Short answer is yes. Um, that is something we're working on right now as a result of what we received Friday afternoon. And I guess I'll, the other point I'll remind my, my colleagues around the, the and, and parents too, that the, 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 the reason for, I guess, setting a, a limit or a deadline on, on deciding, you know, online versus uh, in person for your for your children is the the district has has the challenge of scheduling, hiring, staffing, and the placement of staff. Right, so moving teachers from one school to the other, uh, determining whether they're willing to accept that movement, uh, and and also, and things of that nature. So it really becomes quite a logistics battle in organizing the the staff and scheduling the staff. Plus, I think we mentioned in the previous meeting that it becomes a, uh, um, a lot of these, a lot of the staffs that make these decisions are, are not 12 month employees. They only work 10 or 11 months of the year. And so their uh, ability, our ability to have them extend beyond their contracted uh, obligations is somewhat limited too. So thank you for my, I'm done with my comments. Mr. Wimberly. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess um, what I was going to ask about uh, kind of piggybacks on what Elliot said. And um, first of all, as far as the, the delay uh, or changing the deadline for notification as to what the intentions are for next year, I felt like I made a pretty strong case I thought it was a strong case at the work session for for that delay. Um, but uh, Mr. Golden and Dr. Webb did an outstanding job explaining it. But the thing of, of why it was important now, but the, the one sentence that stuck with me was uh, when Dr. Webb said, if we delay the deadline, we may need to delay the start of the next school year. And to me, I said, all right. Uh, I'll back off of that. Um, but I also wanted to to make sure I heard this correctly. And, and to some degree, it's tied to what you said, Elliot. That three to six uh, change by the CDC is not a minor thing, if I heard correctly, because almost everyone who spoke up about uh, the the pandemic precautions in, in live comment, and certainly, you know, we we hear it over and over, mentioned that um, uh, that there was concern about kids not being able to be together in cafeteria, uh, that there was concern about specials, uh, outdoor activities. And if I heard you right, Mr. Golden, you said that this three to six, and correct me if I'm wrong, will allow you and staff in the coming days, weeks, whenever, to improve elementary element, uh, uh, improve, I think you called it elementary mobility, which means that within this quarter, that some of the schools that have not been using the cafeterias um, the way they did pre-COVID uh, would be looking at expanding the use of the cafeterias and that, uh, that special instruction which has been restricted as far as the mobility of the kids, that some of that mobility would open. And then I think you said on the secondary level that that there was, um, that this really opens up 
uh, the outdoor activities, which includes graduation, and that you and staff would be looking that, at that over some time. So did I hear that correctly? Yes, sir, that's accurate. I will say at the elementary level, um, number one, uh, getting to specials is, is an issue. Number two, um, we're going to explore um, whether, whether based on, on this um, with the, the eating, um, we, um, we can expand at some of those schools that have been sitting in their classrooms, yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Chair. Um, in addition to what Mr. Wimberly brought up and, and to Mr. Galbraith's concerns about the registration deadline, um, if I recall from the work session, if, if people have specific concerns, um, I, I believe Dr. Webb said to contact uh, the principal or a central office, what accommodations should, what, what would advice would you give to somebody who's really struggling with this decision right now in, in the midst of such uncertainty for tomorrow, let alone this fall? Speak with your principal. That's, that's, the, that's the appropriate answer. Um, we, have, we have spent a lot of time um, going through um, individual needs. And it is very important that folks have that deep conversation with their principal about individual needs because we know every student is every student's unique. That's a portion of what school counselors do as well. It's a significant part of a, of a counselor's work to be very specific in counsel. But a short answer, which I struggle with, speak to your principal, share that. Okay, thank you. And then um, I'm excited about any changes that do return us to more normalcy. Um, and as you've termed a new phrase tonight for me, elementary mobility, uh, that sounds like a good thing. Um, but how will those changes be communicated and, and how swiftly do you think that, that we might be able to see some of those things take place? Well, uh, I'll answer the first one first. Uh, we, we're going to communicate it in multiple ways, but it, it, will, it will go directly to parents, uh, every parent. Um, okay. that's, that's, that's number one. Uh, and it may be class by class and school by school because they're, they're because of the, the way um, the school facilities are structured and student numbers and staffing, it, it may look a little bit different at each, each school. Okay. Second, how quickly, uh, it, you know, I, I, I struggle with a specific answer to that. Um, I know we started those conversations today because we got the you know, message for, um, Friday afternoon. Um, so as soon as we can make a change each time, we will. Thank you. Ms. Durham. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Um, just a quick question about, well, I have three questions. One is about prom. Um, is that also gonna be revisited, like graduations as well, you know, with the groups of eight and staying in boxes and, you know, stuff like that? I mean, it seems like if kids can sit in class for several hours, three feet apart, they should be able to be at, be at a prom, you know, just that, I mean, and the reality is that, you know, I was reading emails on our break and a parent said, they're going to be unmasked before at dinner. They're going to be unmasked after at parties. And let's just face reality. It's not like we're going to uh, reduce spread. Order's not going to by putting all these restrictions in place. Same with school. Don't reduce spread by, you know, having them wear masks and having things, you know, all the restrictions because they're just doing their own thing after work, you know, because they're not spending the majority of their time in our building. So I just, I think as much as we can lift and let people make their own decisions overall, the best is for the best. And so just with that, is prom going to be addressed as well? Well, that's, that's a good question. And uh, yes, uh, we are going to review that and, and all our extracurricular activities because the standards have changed. Cool. And, and what, we, what we based our restrictions on was, was a, you know, a prior standard. So it deserves a review. Awesome. Just want to clarify that. Um, and then in terms of the registration, I mean, parents can enroll and then disenroll and then they can not enroll and then they can still enroll when they make their decision. Right. I know it's a deadline, but technically, I mean, we would accept them, you know, August 1st if they enroll. Right. It wouldn't be easy on us to have to adjust and make changes. But the reality is we don't we could still accept or they could just disenroll if they made the decision at a future date to go to a private school, right? 
Well, um, we're a public school. And so anytime anyone uh, arrives, we serve them. Um, I will tell you that there are times where somebody you know, might show up at a particular day when school's in session and it takes a day or two to figure out you know, classes and, and whether they can, whether a class is made, you know, if there's enough students, you think about how a college does, does schedules, whether there's room in a particular class because of pupil teacher ratio. So all those factors will, you know, will become relevant um, yeah. anytime someone comes. Not that I'm encouraging it. I'm just, you know, making a point. I mean, I enrolled my kids, but I'm definitely going to make a decision for, you know, my son's senior year and my daughter's sophomore year based on where they can have the most normal experience. Um, so, you know, playing basketball, doing dance team, just all the things that they want to do. I want to make sure they get the most robust, unrestricted high school experience they can get. So they're enrolled, but they're going to go where oh, ultimately where I feel like they're going to get the best experience. So, um, so I just want to, I guess, emphasize too with the parents who joined the call today, which I really appreciate everybody coming on. Um, I, don't, I, I, I think there's a lot of discussion around masks, but I think it's the whole, again, the whole experience. Um, and from a learning and communicating perspective, it's very difficult to communicate, learn, get to know people and whatever in a mask. So I cannot wait for the mask to be gone. Um, I don't wear them any chance I get not to wear them. <laughs> and so it's definitely, I support as much freedom in our faces as well. <laughs> so, but thank you. I know everybody's just trying to um, make the right decisions. I, I just feel it necessary to share my position too. So I support lo lo loosening things up and giving freedoms and letting parents make choices. Thank you. Mr. Cash. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Dan Cash, Second District. Uh, Angela, I, I couldn't agree with you more. That was part of what I wanted to say. And Jay, thank you for uh, taking, uh, I mean, talking about the, the real issues. Um, Jason, we have, we have the CDC, the State Health Department, the Local Health Department, TSSAA, all these entities that have say in what our children do and what our parents do. Um, I've got a real problem with some of those. Uh, you know, the TSSAA, um, now we still have to have temperature checks. Well, you know, it's no big deal really, I guess. But uh, uh, in the case of the cheerleaders, we have uh, and, and kind of like referring to what Angela said, we have uh, wrestlers out there sweating on each other, basketball players bumping and rubbing, uh, you know, football face to face. And yet they make a decision based on what for cheerleaders. That, that, that's something that I feel this school system has the authority to say, hey, we're going to do this for these cheerleaders and they are going to perform. That never happened. There's, there seems to always be some fine point, some fine um, uh, T that's not crossed or that is crossed that keeps us from uh, going to school or on how we quarantine. Um, I mean, am I right or wrong? How many different entities are we dealing with? Six here? Five. Uh, you, you you fit the right ones, and uh, and Mr. Cash, and and that's a that's an excellent point about cheerleaders, and we we agreed with that. And you all may recall the TSSAA said we didn't want to do this either, but we received a directive from the governor, and it, it took a few weeks. But boy, I'm glad I'm glad we were able to get that changed. Um, but well, you're it was right. Six weeks. It was six weeks. Their whole their whole semester. I mean, I don't care what the TSSA, they didn't want to do this or it's because what somebody said at the governor's office. That's where I feel that this board should be more involved in these decisions and that with the board support, that gives you the support you need to make a decision like that. But to go on, I, you know, about the, the uh, registration, uh, did I also hear uh, that it's going to be only for one semester? 
Yes, sir. We're that still might, that might help. Yeah. That might help some people. But in the case of quarantines, now my my grandson, first grader, I was called on last the Tuesday before spring break. I had to go pick him up. He was quarantined. No date to come back. Of course, we were going to spring break, so that took care of that. But I asked, where, why haven't we, I usually get an email or a text, or my son does. Neither one of us ever got a text from the health department. Never heard from the health department whatsoever, but we were sent home from school. Okay. All right. My, uh, my seventh grade grandson, I was called to pick him up because he was quarantined. Never heard from the health department. Then, then all of a sudden, after about uh, eight days that time, they started asking how he felt. Okay. The only one out of my four that the health department did contact my son was with my fifth grader. That was done in the process that we have set up. So I don't know who's doing this or what the health department's doing. I don't care if they're backed up or what their problem is. They want to handle all this, but I'm just saying, and that's my personal, you know, experience. Now there's many more like, just like that. So where I would like to get is I would like this board to have more say rather than sit here and, and talk about this stuff till we're blue in the face, which doesn't matter because this board has no say in this. To continue on like we're doing, I think we need to really look uh, at some changes uh, you know, in, in the process. Again, I said it early, early on that I didn't feel like, I thought this was much too big for just a superintendent or a couple of staff members to make decisions for. So uh, let me just look, just to make sure. Jay made some really good points and I agree with him, uh, you know, on some of this, the distancing and whatnot. So I, I think, uh, you know, a couple of us might be, if it's possible to be in a, you know, a session with, with Dana on that. Uh, if that's possible, I don't know if it is. I don't think it is, but and uh, so anyhow, I see Dana on there. Yes, sir, Miss Chairman Garrett. If I may, Mr. Cash, I am always happy to uh, speak with you offline. If there's some questions that you have about authority or what um, what you want to see happen or suggestions, feel free to. Um, to reach out to me and, and we can have those discussions. Okay. Now those, those discussions will be separate. I will not have a discussion with both you and Mr. Galbraith at the same right. time, but well, I'm that's happy what, to that's, talk to you. That's what I thought. But, but going forward, uh, these decisions, um, you know, who had, who does have the authority, like a couple of school system board members have been voting on this stuff in other school districts, but we're, we're dealing with one of the six, six uh, areas that has a health department, correct, uh, Jason? Uh, it's actually the uh, other way around um, on the health department. The, the big uh, metropolitan areas are their own health department and the state governs us and most of the-, of the, of the uh, Oh, county. the state does govern Williamson County? Yes. Okay, I thought we had our own uh, yeah. along with that. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Okay, thank you. That's what I wanted to say. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Cash. And it, it, real, real quickly, to your point, you're right. There are a number of entities who have their area of authority. In our area of authority, you know, we we addressed with uh, with the with the board vote for our plan back in July. Sorry, Madam Chair. Go ahead. That's okay. I was just going to call on Mr. Welch. Thank you. Um, I guess I have a question, or I guess my question is: Is there an action on the floor? for us to be considering or voting on. Um, Chairman Garrett, if I may, to answer your question, Mr. Welch, no, there is not. This has been a series of questions over the last hour uh, to Mr. Superintendent Golden regarding his report. Well, Dana, I'm gonna disagree with you. I don't think it has been a series of questions. I, I think it's been a series of, of statements. And we, 
we're two hours into the meeting. Um, if there's action to be taken, then I would say we should have an agenda item and discuss it at a work session and vote on it at a board meeting. But we're rehashing the same conversations we've had here for three, six, nine months. Uh, and there's no action to be taken. So if this is the will of the board or this is what individuals want, then I would respectively suggest that it should be placed on the agenda. The motion should be made and we should discuss it at that point because um, we're spinning our wheels again and again here. And there's nothing that uh, is being accomplished other than uh, the same discussion that's already taken place again and again. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Mr. Mitchell? I'm sorry, my hand it wasn't up. I'll take it down. Okay, thank you. Okay, I believe that is our last comment um, from Mr. Golden's report. And now we will move on to Ms. Birdsong's student, staff, and school spotlights. And I understand that there are many, many student spotlights this month. So Ms. Birdsong. And, and Madam Chair, this is Jason Gold. If I may just preface this, um, I'm so excited about these because it really just does emphasize the, the successful work that our uh, students have been doing this year. Ms. Birdsong. Thank you, Mr. Golden. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Garrett, we are celebrating tonight many, many students. So for the third year in a row, and Mr. McNeese is assisting me. And so thank you, Mr. McNeese. For the third year in a row, we are celebrating more than 50 students who are being recognized as national merit finalists. We are going to start at Brentwood High School with Patrick Bowe, Shilpa Chowby, Joe Grunberg, Abby Jordan. Next slide, thank you. Parker Kiswick, Tristan Kennedy, Julia Lee and Oakley Martin. Isabel Oldham, Kylie Overton, Michelle Wee, Samuel Robbie. Also from Brentwood High School, Anna Sullivan, Emily Blanchak, Stephen Walter, Elise Wilkins, and Ron Yee. From Centennial High School, this is Jacob Williams. From Fairview High School, this is Ryan Kilgore. And from Franklin High School, we have Jason Amsler, Connor Beaven, Williams Foster, Eileen Hu, Sue, Patrick Lama, Daniel Matten, Sarah Naughton, whoops, I got ahead of myself, Brand, Brandon Vaughn, Ella Watley, and Joy Yin. From Independence High School, Joshua Cannon, Benjamin Dondanville, Amelia Prouse, and Emily Sauer. From Nolansville High School, Alex Jones. From Page High School, Hallie Berg, Anika Koshik. Logan Sava, and Lee Walters. From Ravenwood High School, Sharita Abdalaba, Chris Abram, William Fike, and Ashley Harmon. Also from Ravenwood High School, Amy Hurd, Trisha Mazdumar, Ashana Maida, Emma Meyer, also from Ravenwood High School, Peter Salmon, Selena Wang, Christian West, and Aaron Wu. From Summit High School, Nava Brinson. Those are your National Merit finalists. Now, we are going to move into the Tennessee High School Press Association Awards. And once again, Brentwood High School has been named the best TV station in the state of Tennessee. Also, Brentwood High School brought home the award for best sports coverage of a live event. Also, Brentwood High School's Harrison McConnell won for the best 
sports show. Chad Barker won first place state award for the best sports feature story. And Alex Wells, Cami Rodman, Jack Wilson, and Zach Kamer won for the best public service announcement. Their teacher is Ronnie Adcock. But Franklin High School also brought home an award. This is Christian Ward, best commercial. His teacher is Carrie Thompson. And Independence High School won for Best Music Video, Harrison Kyle and Gabe Hall. And they also won at Independence for the Best Sports Video. This is Bradley Hicks and Sam Wild. Their teacher is Matt Balzer. And in Athletics from Fairview High School, this is Riley Bennett. He won the TSSAA Wrestling Single AAA State Championship in the 145-pound weight class. His coach is James Derrick. So, board members, Mr. Golden, so many students to celebrate tonight. Congratulations to them all. Thank you, Ms. Birdsong. Those are... Those are really nice celebrations to see during this, this year that is so unique. So appreciate your time and putting that information together for us. Moving on to the board chair's report. I have a few items here, uh, some, some brief notes and reminders. First of all, we've received an email to sign up to volunteer at the round two vaccine clinics for Williamson County Schools both this week and next. Uh, please let Ms. Glenn know if you want to work one of those slots or one or more of those slots. Uh, I think we talked about what a great experience that was to be able to see our teachers because we haven't been able to see so many of our teachers and staff, the staff this year. And um, so if you haven't done that, I encourage you to find some time on your calendar and get over there if possible. Um, the second thing that I want to report is that March 29th from 6 to 8 is our board's meeting with Fostering Healthy Solutions, and we'll be discussing diversity and inclusion topics. Uh, so please make sure you have that on your calendar. Also, per the Tennessee School Board Association, please register if you plan to attend the TSBA convention in the fall. We've all received an email about that. Um, and then um, just want to remind everyone that right now um, there are three primary ways that we can stay in touch with constituents, and those are our WCS emails, phone calls, and then uh, public comment like we had tonight. Of course, the um, email and phone calls are the opportunity to have more interaction with folks, uh, and sometimes... Um, you know, a, a, much, a much speedier way to talk to people and understand what their concerns are. And regarding concerns, we, we had a lot of discussion here. You know, usually these monthly meetings are voting meetings. And obviously um, we had more discussion here than we normally have at our voting meetings. Um, but I just, want, I just want to make sure that, that we continue to provide this input from our constituents uh, to Superintendent Golden and to our staff, um, because this is certainly not the only place to, to give and receive that feedback. We, we have the opportunity to take some of these ideas that we've heard and um, you know, provide them to the staff. And I just wanna reiterate that the staff did say to us that you know, they've received this information Friday when, when everybody was on, on spring break and they've been looking at it today. So I'm confident that the staff will respond to anything that we forward to them and anything that we bring to them um, during this week. And I know that I'm, I'm confident as well that there's an emphasis on trying to, to do that and to see what we can open up quickly. Um, so I just want to make sure that we, we continue to do that, not just in this meeting, but outside of this meeting. And then finally, I, I want to address something that, that I haven't heard before this year on the board, 
but you know it's it's a discussion of you know there's a big division you know there's a possibly a division between board members who have children in schools and board members who don't and I just, I want to say that I think that every different perspective brings value. And I am now one of those board members who is not a a current parent after 12 years of being a parent and 12 years of being a PTO officer and 12 years of being very engaged in what my child was doing. But the, the side of that, that I want to make sure that we all appreciate and respect is that what that brings me is much more opportunity to talk to parents and to be at other students, students events other than mine and much more free time to really reach out to people and engage with people. And I think that's true, um, you know, with, with other people too. So I just, I just want to make sure that, that we appreciate that we bring a variety of experiences. We bring a variety of professional expertise um, to this, to our meetings and to our works. And I appreciate that. Um, I know that many of us have family members who are still in schools and we have, we are very close to those perspectives and close to the issues of what is going on with our students this year. So I just want to say that to everybody and also want to say that I appreciate everybody's unique perspective. So thank you. And that concludes my report. And now we'll move on to new business. And the first thing is the 2020-2021 school board budget, the approval of the general purpose school fund amendment 3.2.1 GPS private grant award, $5,000, Mr. Golden. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a a private grant for STEM and we are asking for your approval for us to accept it and put it into tech supplies uh, with the detail that was in the memo. Recommend approval. Is there a motion to approve? Uh, Brad Fiscus, motion to approve. Mr. Fiscus makes the motion. Is there a second? Dan Cash, second. Mr. Cash seconds. Is there any discussion? There's no discussion. Ms. Glenn, we can move to a vote, please. Madam Chair, this is Lydia Glenn. Angela Durham. Angela Durham, yes. Dan Cash. Dan Cash, yes. Elliot Mitchell. Elliot Mitchell, yes. Brad Fiscus. Brad Fiscus, yes. Jenna Priya. Yes. Jay Galbraith. Jay Galbraith, yes. Sheila Cleveland. Sheila Cleveland, yes. Candy Emerson. Ms. Simerson, I believe you're still on mute. Press the space bar and hold it down and talk. Thank you. Yes, Candy Emerson. Wimberly. Rick Wimberly, yes. Eric Welch. Eric Welch, yes. Casey Hall. Casey Hall, yes. Nancy Garrett. Nancy Garrett, yes. Vote is 12 yes, zero no. Your motion passes. Thank you. Our next item is the approval of the 2021-2022 school budget. And the first item is the general purpose school fund, Mr. Golden. Thank you, Madam Chair. As you know from uh, the budget work session we had in the work session and a number of questions that you all were good enough to ask of uh, of, uh, of our staff, uh, we have prepared the budget for you. And I want to mention uh, some just a small uh, number of key points, just to reemphasize this for those who, who are watching. Uh, we, we've included a recommended 4% uh, pay increase for next year for our, for our faculty and staff. Uh, we have added a significant amount of funding for the online program. Uh, and, uh, and we have made sure that we have covered uh, the, the special education needs of our students. Uh, we do recommend approval. Is there a motion to approve? Rick Wimberly moved to approve. Mr. Wimberly makes the motion. Is there a second? Eric Welch, second. 
Mr. Welch seconds. Is there any discussion? Uh, Mr. Fiscus. Um, Mr. Golden, there's always a lot of discussion about the BEP. Um, and for, for those listening, can you help, or maybe Rachel uh, would, let's, so that we can be clear about what we fund from the county, funding, what BEP funds, um, and so that that would help people understand a little bit how this funding works. Thank you, Mr. Fiskus. That's a great question. BEP is the basic educational program that the state funds. It, it is a baseline percentage of what they have determined at the state level is the basics of education. Um, I don't know a district in the state that doesn't fund more than BEP because it, 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 is, it is clearly from an educational pers um, perspective um, not covering everything we need, especially at places like, uh, like Williamson County where, where we offer a lot of instructional choice, especially at the high school level, um, our, our county does more. Um, and I'm estimating, Rachel, correct me if I'm wrong, somewhere around 59% of our total funding comes from the county. Um, then BEP is next, and then we get maybe about 2% or so a year from federal. Uh, so that should give folks uh, a perspective that over the years, our board has, uh, has, has set um, high standards for the services we provide, and our commission has funded it to a pretty high level. And so this recent um, uh, money that was given from the state, um, we, were, we had, to, in order to give our, our teachers a bonus, we had to fund part of that bonus uh, for the 2021 bonus that we just gave them, correct? So that, that's a good question. So the state put money in uh, um, through, a, through a special called um, uh, January um, legislative meeting. Uh, they voted to, to fund a particular portion of BEP, which covered classroom teachers, um, some nurses, and a, and a handful of other specific jobs. There were many jobs in the district that were not part of that piece of the BEP that they put money into. So yes, we did um, um, pay for, um, you know, through, through our funding, through your vote and through the commission approving the expenditure, those other positions that were not part of that particular element that where the, where the state put money. Thank you. Mr. Galbraith. Thank you, Madam Chair, Jay Galbraith. Uh, I guess this is for, um, for Ms. Farmer. And I just wanted to know if the if our gap has gone down based on any additional information that we've received over the over the last couple of weeks since our last meeting. Thank you, Mr. Galbraith. This is um, Rachel Farmer, and the answer to your question is: with us being closed this week, there has not been a whole lot of change, other than we do feel very strongly um, that the sales tax number that we had kind of projected, um, well not had, that we had projected, um, there will be a little bit more in sales tax coming in that's gonna help bridge that gap. Is, wasn't the, wasn't the ESSER, the ESSER number, the, that 5.2 million, that was not in, in this, in, included in here, right? That is correct. That's and that correct. is another 5.2 million that we have um, coming our way. And, and there was also the, I thought there was a couple. I thought there was two point two million or so that we weren't showing as um, as going to be received that we plan to receive also from the federal. I mean, maybe that was S or two. Uh, it was from your spreadsheet, um, that, that, right? That is from S or two, and that is correct. So there's two. There's around two million plus potentially another five million from S or three. That we have. Yes, that we have coming in that we have not accounted for. The thing to keep in mind with ESSER 3 is part of that is going to be going towards, we need to allocate it towards learning loss, which will go into next year's um, fiscal budget. Some of the ESSER 2 is coming, hitting back in this year. Right, uh, but this year, I mean, it would, fund balance, it, would yes. either, it would either contribute towards the beginning fund balance or the ending fund balance, assuming that we, we're, we're not, Jason, we're not gonna, we're not gonna spend any more money based on whether we get federal funds or not, correct? 
That's right. Well, uh, our plan uh, is not to spend something for the sake of spending it based on federal. I will tell you one example with ESSER two that's actually in this in this agenda. Um, we did not include about 1.5 million in this in this budget before you for um, for technology because our plan is to pay for that out of ESSER. So that's actually a, a reduction in the in the budget in the, in that sense because we did not include it in the budget. Um, ESSER 3.0 has some more restrictions. So we we just got notice o o last week about the about the projected number, the actual number actually uh, that uh, every county is going to get, and that's the 5.2 that you're referencing. It is restricted uh, to Miss Farmer's point. They they're restricting it to what they're describing as learning loss. So we're going to have some work to do. Uh, to figure out how to address uh, that, knowing that those are restricted funds. Is that, but the, any, any money that we spend this summer would be, would, would fit that bill, right? That's correct. And, and, and we're, and we're only getting, I mean, we're, we're certainly not getting enough money. So uh, do we, do we know how much money we're going to be spending this summer on those summer camps that we, we don't, don't that's a good question. We don't yet know that for sure. And we also don't know how much the state's going to give. They did budget some uh, for this and it's based on enrollment and ratios uh, of, of, uh, of, the, of which students come. And that's why that's one of the big reasons we don't know how much we're going to um, actually spend. Um, but yes, to your point, uh, we can we can make sure that no, no money. I'm confident based on that number, Rachel, correct me if I'm wrong, that we will spend no general fund money. Uh, out of um, uh, for for the for the uh, summer school program that the legislature approved based on this okay. because we now have this ESSER 3.0. So for learning loss, couldn't couldn't some of our RTI that's over and above um, that's over and above what the what the state provides be considered towards learning loss? I'm just, can you ask the question again? Sorry. Our specialists that, that, that are focused on RTI. Oh, I got you. Thank you. Um, one of the things we're going to have to evaluate is whether whether there's uh, there's an allowance for what is traditionally described as supplanting with federal funds. Um, we, the, generally speaking, they do not allow you to supplant existing programs with federal funds. That's something that we've got to get an answer to. Okay. Well, so so all the the ESSER three outstanding i mean i guess the answer to that being we'll get as much as we can um it seems like we're going to have plenty to to bridge the 5.5 million dollar gap that we have my goal is still to um to get to a to a number uh, in excess of that that we can that we can fund our our fund balance to a to an acceptable level uh, and, I, and i still have you would, have you had a conversation with the mayor about that since we talked? Um, I've, I've let him know that that's something we're looking for. Um, uh, and I don't have any good answers from him at this stage. Uh, um, what I what what I believe is we're in late March. They're ultimately working on their budget in July. Um, I think there will be a lot of discussion at public meetings um, at the commission level. Over the course of these, of, of, over the course of the few months that they start working on their budget, um, uh, what what I do know is that they've worked really hard on getting alternative funding sources for us. Uh, you all know that on the capital side, especially, uh, and so my hope is that they see they see the the same opportunity that uh, you've described in this. Right. Context. Okay. Well, thank you. And I, I, I mean, I'm obviously we don't set the revenue side of the budget. We're just setting what we think is going to come in. And so I'm, I'm comfortable with the expense side of the general of the general purpose fund. Um, I would just like to, uh, and I obviously, uh, I would, I would love for, for any of our board members to, um, to talk with a well, talk with the county commission about, um, about the revenue side to, to see if it's possible for. For, for them to set the set the tax rate in such a way that that it that it funds the budget without using the um, the one time increase from the sales tax that we're getting this year, um, and it would allow it to to increase our fund balance to give us some to give us all some flexibility go, going forward. I'm, I'm speaking not necessarily as a board member, but as a as a as a taxpayer and a citizen. I would I would love to be able to. To go from, from a, as a board standpoint, I would love to be able to work with the commission 
so that they have some flexibility when when they're short in a future budget um, over the next three years to to be able to have something to pull from rather than us having to use our entire fund balance to to balance our, our budget every year. So um, I appreciate it. Thanks, Ms. Farmer. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. We can move to a vote, Ms. Ms. Glenn. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Lydia Glenn. Angela Durham. Angela Durham, yes. Dan Cash. Dan Cash, yes. Elliot Mitchell. Elliot Mitchell, yes. Brad Fiscus. Brad Fiscus, yes. Jenna Priya. Yes. Jay Galbraith. Jay Galbraith, yes. Sheila Cleveland. Sheila Cleveland, yes. Candy Emerson. Candy Emerson, yes. Rick Wimberly. Rick Wimberly, yes. Eric Welch. Eric Welch, yes. Casey Hall. Casey Hall, yes. Nancy Garrett. Nancy Garrett, yes. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no, motion passes. Thank you. The next item is the Central Cafeteria Fund. Mr. Golden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, likewise, uh, we've had this discussion about the Central Cafeteria Fund, um, and uh, I appreciate all the questions that you've asked, and uh, we do recommend approval of that fund, or that budget, rather. Thank, Thank you. you. We have a motion to approve. Candy Emerson, uh, move to approve. Ms. Emerson makes the motion. Do we have a second? Eric Welch, second. Mr. Welch, seconds. Is there any discussion? Mr. Galbraith. Thank you, Madam Chair, Jay Galbraith. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I know we, we discussed this a lot at the at the work session as well. Um, in, the, in its current form, I just, I just can't, I can't support this budget. Um, I just don't, I don't feel like it, um, you know, the fact that we have, the, the fact that we've allowed the, um, the fund balance to to decline and we put a million and a half in uh, plus whatever we have to put in this year to um to provide solvency to a fund that we really shouldn't be uh subsidizing um, i just don't support and I, I don't support us providing a a loan um that's not documented and and without a without any payment terms and we're not including any any kind of repayment uh, terms in the uh, in this budget so I I just I don't think it's responsible and um, and I just can't support it so that's my that's going to be my vote thank you mr Galbraith I did this is Jason Golan definitely respect that and appreciate your sharing of your thoughts um, throughout this process mr Welch yeah, just for a point of clarification, I want to make sure the public understands that the loan is Williamson County Schools loaning money to Williamson County Schools, and the repayment would be Williamson County Schools paying back Williamson County Schools. It's it's moving numbers between line items on a ledger. It is not loaning money to any outside organization. Thank you, Mr. Welch, for that. Um, you are you are correct, and that's something that the that uh, the board um, looked at a couple of months ago. Thank you. I have my hand up. Um, so, regarding this approach to addressing the the fund balance, um, we did benchmark what other districts were doing, correct? And what were those other districts doing? Yes, ma'am, we did benchmark other districts. I would actually like to um, refer to Ms. Farmer for that. Okay, thank you. This is Rachel Farmer, and yes, we actually reached out to um, the Division of Local Government Audit and, and asked them to give us um, their best recommendation on how to handle a situation where we had a fund that could potentially end with a negative fund balance, which can happen. And that was the directive they gave us. Um, it is happening all across the state um, in situations 
that has come up and it has come to them with some with the same kind of questions. Um, and their recommendation was to do the transfer from funds um, from fund to fund with the stipulation that it should be paid back when a fund balance that was sufficient was there um, in order to pay it back. Um, other counties around us, including I know Rutherford County um, is in a similar situation have done the same thing. And also um, just, just another question. Um, let me, let me, I've got my notes here. Um, so it is, so we're, we're in a, we're in a very unique situation. We've just, we've just been in a situation um, where, you know, the, the reason you have a fund balance is basically, you know, things like, things like what we've just gone to. So that, I'm, I'm personally very, very uh, proud of our decade long um, audit of no findings. Do we feel like using this approach uh, that has been recommended by this, by this outside local government entity, do, are there concerns that, that we're going to get dinged about this in any way? Again, this is Rachel Farmer and no ma'am. I mean, this, the, local government audit for Tennessee. Um, that is who gave us the directive and they would be who our auditors were coming in. Um, the assistant director actually for the state comptroller's office is who gave us the um, instructions on how to handle it. So this is definitely would not be an audit finding. And just one more question. Um, would the district accept donations to help um, ad address the budget gap? We always accept donations. <laughs> We always accept donations for um, for anything that the um, community is willing to help with. Okay. And, and Madam Chair, if I may, since you asked about donations, of course, anyone can make restricted gift donations. Um, but I will tell you one of the points of emphasis, and Mr. Galbraith actually spoke to this um, week, weeks ago, is uh, – for every meal that we serve through the end of the school year, and actually, if I'm not mistaken, it, um, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, it goes through the end of September, I believe, maybe October. Um, the the uh, federal government is reimbursing every meal, 100%. So everyone um, can uh, can get a school lunch uh, um, for, for no charge. And we actually ask that you do that. Uh, let us serve your children. Uh, this this fourth quarter. Um, take a break from from sending lunch if you still feel like you need to send you know an item. Great, um, but but take a lunch um, and that'll actually help us as well. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Galbraith. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I also wanted to clarify. So yes, these are these are these are both funds that are that are both fully Williamson County Schools, but. The reason that they're separate funds is we have a general purpose school fund that's funded by the tax rate, and we have a uh, we have two funds that are supposed to be self-sustaining. And so, my, I guess, Rachel, I've got a question um, with regards to the there. There was a half a million dollars that we transferred from the general purpose school fund last year, uh, and then there was another half a million dollars that we that we transferred. Um, that was specifically related to the CARES Act. So um, with respect to that, those two buckets of money, uh, roughly a half a million dollars a piece, is, were those given as a loan or were those, or were we able to somehow transfer money from the general purpose to the, um, to the uh, cafeteria fund? And we, we gave some also money to the, uh, to the to the SAC fund as well, but how 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 are we allowed to to make those transfers if the if the guidance for this for this you know up to two million dollar shortfall for this this fiscal year was determined that we should do it as a loan? It's actually not a loan in technical terms. It is a transfer between funds. We wrote the resolution with the wording that the intent is for the funds to be paid back when a sufficient fund balance is available. Because the state of within the state of Tennessee, you can run the cafeteria funds in two different ways. One is it falls under the GP and one is, it's, is, is it is its own separate fund. We have traditionally kept it as its own separate fund, but we can move funds between the different, um, we can move money between the different funds. And so yeah. 
the state recommended that we just, what would be an audit finding going back to Mrs. Garrett's question would be if we ended up with a negative fund balance in one of these funds, which we can't do, we won't do. And that's why we made the recommendation. And so in answer to your question, the first um, 500, my understanding is that was a transfer. And then the second was part of um, a reimbursement from CARES. And so that was not money coming out of our pocket per se. It came from additional funding that we did receive. So, so the only, so I understand the difference between a transfer that's intended to be paid back versus a loan. So I, I get that. Um, but in, so from your perspective, the only money that is, that will, that will be intended to be paid back is the money that we, that we give for under this fiscal year, um, under the resolution that allowed for up to $2 million to be transferred. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Hey, I don't see any other questions. Ms. Glenn? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Angela Durham. Angela Durham, yes. Dan Cash. Dan Cash, yes. Elliot Mitchell. Elliot Mitchell, yes. Brad Fiscus. Brad Fiscus, yes. Napria. Napria, yes. Jay Galbraith. Jay Galbraith, no. Sheila Cleveland. Sheila Cleveland, yes. Candy Emerson. Candy Emerson, yes. Rick Wimberly. Rick Wimberly, yes. Eric Welch. Eric Welch, yes. Casey Hall. Casey Hall, yes. Nancy Garrett. Nancy Garrett, yes. Your vote is 11 yes, one no. Motion passes. Thank you. Our next item is the Extended School Program Fund. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Jason Golden here. Uh, this is uh, our third uh, a fund and final fund that we are asking for your budget approval prior to bringing this to the commission for their ultimate uh, uh, vote um, in, uh, in, in July, hopefully. Uh, this is another one of what we call the Enterprise Funds, the Extended School Program Fund, uh, and we've had those discussions over these uh, prior two meetings. We do uh, recommend approval of this proposed budget. Thank you. Do we have a motion to approve? Rick Wimberly moved to approve. Mr. Wimberly, do we have a second? Elliot Mitchell seconds. Mr. Mitchell seconds. Is there any discussion? I see no hands up. Ms. Glenn, we can move to a vote, please. Durham. Angela Durham, yes. Dan Cash. Dan Cash, yes. Elliot Mitchell. Elliot Mitchell, yes. Brad Fiscus. Brad Fiscus, yes. Napriya. Priya, yes. Jay Galbraith. Jay Galbraith, yes. Sheila Cleveland. Sheila Cleveland, yes. Candy Emerson. Candy Emerson, yes. Rick Wimberly. Rick Wimberly, yes. Eric Welch. Eric Welch, yes. Casey Hall. Casey Hall, yes. All right. Nancy Garrett, yes. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no. Motion passes. Thank you. And the final budget related item for this evening is the approval of the ePlan ESSER II CARES Act grant and budget for FY 2021, Mr. Golden. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is what we are calling ESSER 2.0. And as Mr. Gabbard mentioned, there is an ESSER 3.0 uh, coming down the line. So this is our, uh, uh, our request that you approve uh, the specific funding based on the funds that uh, are passing through the state level. Uh, from the federal government to us. Recommend approval. Is there a motion to approve? Andy oh, Emerson, yeah. motion to approve. Ms. Emerson makes the motion. Is there a second? Elliot Mitchell seconds. Mr. Mitchell makes the second. Is there any discussion? Scroll through here. I see no hands raised, so we can move to a vote, Ms. Glenn. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Lydia Glenn. Angela Durham. Angela Durham, yes. Dan Cash. Dan Cash, yes. Elliot Mitchell. 
Elliot Mitchell, yes. Brad Fiscus. Brad Fiscus, yes. Rhea. Yeah, yes. Jake Albreth. Jake Albreth, yes. Sheila Cleveland. Sheila Cleveland, yes. Sheila Cleveland, yes. Candy Emerson. Andy Emerson, yes. Rick Wimberly. Rick Wimberly, yes. Eric Welch. Eric Welch, yes. Casey Hall. Casey Hall, uh, yes. Garrett. Nancy Garrett, yes. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no, motion passes. Thank you, board. The next item on the agenda is board policies for first reading. And the first one is 4.600, report cards and grading systems. Thank you, Madam Chair. This proposal is actually a change on the third page of uh, the, the policy at issue, which is to add the International Baccalaureate Program uh, to AP, uh, Advanced Placement Classes for the purposes of, uh, of the uh, Latin system awards and, um, and uh, valedictorian and salutatorian. This is a specific request related to Franklin High School since it is our only IP program. And uh, we ask for your approval of, on first reading. Motion to approve. Andy Emerson, motion to approve. Emerson, is there a second? And Cash, second. Mr. Cash seconds, is there any discussion? I see no hands up, we can move to a vote. Durham. Angela Durham, yes. Dan Cash. Dan Cash, yes. Elliot Mitchell. Elliot Mitchell, yes. Brad Fiscus. Brad Fiscus, yes. Jenna Priya. Priya, yes. Jake Albreth. Jake Albreth, yes. Sheila Cleveland. Sheila Cleveland, yes. Candy Emerson. Candy Emerson, yes. Wimberly. Rick Wimberly, yes. Eric Welch. Eric Welch, yes. Casey Hall. Casey Hall, yes. Garrett. Nancy Garrett, yes. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no, motion passes. The next policy for first reading is 5.104, Equal Opportunity Employment. Mr. Golden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this proposal uh, comes from uh, Ms. Osbrooks and, um, and from our Human Resources Department based on uh, the detail of all the federal protections. Uh, and uh, we are recommending approval at first reading because these are all uh, classifications of protected um, classes for employment purposes. Recommend approval. Do we have a motion to approve? Oh, and I'll make a motion. Motion approved. to approve from Nancy Garrett. Is there a second? Candy Emerson, second. Ms. Emerson, seconds. Any discussion? I see no discussion. Ms. Glenn, may we please vote? Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Lydia Glenn. Angela Durham. Angela Durham, yes. Dan Cash. Dan Cash, yes. Elliot Mitchell. Elliot Mitchell, yes. Brad Fiscus. Brad Fiscus, yes. Jenna Priya. Jenna Priya, yes. Jake Albreth. Jake Albreth, yes. Cleveland. Sheila Cleveland, yes. Candy Emerson. Candy Emerson, yes. Rick Wimberly. Rick Wimberly, yes. Eric Welch. Eric Welch, yes. Casey Hall. Casey Hall, yes. Nancy Garrett. Nancy Garrett, yes. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no, motion passes. Thank you. The next item, policy 5200, separation practices for tenured teachers. Thank you, Madam Chair. This uh, particular uh, vote and the next one um, actually represent a separation of one existing policy. Uh, and um, what we are working to do with this is make sure that all the detail of separation practices for tenured teachers and, and separation practices for non-tenured teachers be contained in one policy. Uh, it, it, to really figure this out, it takes going to multiple laws. And so 
uh, Ms. Osbrooks and uh, again, Ms. Hall uh, from our Human Resources Department uh, work together to put to, together something where our teachers can actually get a clear understanding of, uh, of that process in one policy. So we recommend approval. Do you have a motion to approve? Brad Fiscus moved to approve. Mr. Fiscus makes the motion. Is there a second? Van Tash, second. Mr. Cash seconds. Any discussion? I see no discussion, Ms. Glenn. Durham? Angela Durham, yes. Van Cash. Van Cash, yes. Oh. Elliot Mitchell, yes. Brad Fiscus. Brad Fiscus, yes. Jenna Priya. Jenna Priya, yes. Jay Galbraith. Jay Galbraith, yes. Sheila Cleveland. Sheila Cleveland, yes. Candy Emerson. Candy Emerson, yes. Rick Wimberly, yes. Eric Welch. Eric Welch, yes. Casey Hall. Casey Hall, yes. Nancy Garrett. Nancy Garrett, yes. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no, motion passes. Policy 5.201, separation practice for non-tenure teachers, Mr. Golden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Likewise, uh, as I mentioned for the previous item, uh, we recommend approval. I have a motion to approve. Angela Durham, yes. Or, Makes approve. the motion. Do we have a second? <laughs> Is there a second? Brad Fiscus, second. Mr. Fiscus, second. Is there any discussion? I see no discussion. Ms. Glenn. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Lydia Glenn. Angela Durham. Angela Durham, yes. Dan Cash. Dan Cash, yes. Elliot Mitchell. Elliot Mitchell, yes. Brad Fiscus. Brad Fiscus, yes. Jenna Priya. Jenna Priya, yes. Jay Galbraith. Jay Galbraith, yes. Candy Emerson. Candy Emerson, yes. Wimberly. Rick Wimberly, yes. And I believe you missed Miss Cleveland. I'm so sorry. And Sheila Cleveland's yes. Sheila Cleveland, yes. Thank you. Eric Welch. Eric Welch, yes. Paul. You see hi, yes. Eric. Nancy Garrett, yes. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no, motion passes. Next up is an annual agenda item, the approval of high school courses, Mr. Golden. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have one memo in your board packet for the next two votes. Uh, annually, we, uh, we request uh, that you approve special high school courses uh, uh, and high school course applications. And uh, this year for this particular item, we are asking that you approve uh, African American history, exercise science, pre law, social media marketing and analytics, principles of agribusiness, and agricultural business and finance. We recommend approval of those courses. Board member, do we have a motion? Board members, do we have a motion to approve? Rick Wimberly okay. moved to approve. Mr. Wimberly makes the motion. Is there a second? Yeah, well, Angela yeah. Durham. Ms. Durham seconds. Is there any discussion, board members? Yes, Mr. Welch. Uh, Mr. Well, I just thought of this. Are any of these courses, as I'm looking through it, um, honors or, uh, well, I guess it would be AP, but are, are any of the any of them honors level? Uh, that's a great question. The answer to that is no. At this stage, they're not. Uh, they, they, uh, they are generally speaking electives, but uh, um, uh, uh, we, at this first stage of getting approval, we don't have an honors curriculum structure for them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, we'll move to a vote, Ms. Glenn. Madam Chair, this is Lydia Glenn. Angela Durham. Angela Durham, yes. Dan Cash. Dan Cash, yes. Elliot Mitchell. Elliot Mitchell, yes. Brad Fiscus. Brad Fiscus, yes. Jenna Priya. Jenna Priya, yes. Jay Galbraith. Jay Galbraith, yes. Sheila Cleveland. Sheila Cleveland, yes. Candy Emerson. 
Andy Emerson, yes. Rick Wimberly, yes. Welch? Eric Welch, yes. Casey Hall? Casey Hall, uh, yes. Nancy Garrett? Nancy Garrett, yes. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no, motion passes. Okay. And board members, our final agenda item for tonight is the approval of the special course applications and this is also an annual agenda item. Mr. Gold. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. This year we are proposing uh, World War II honors and to Mr. Welch's point, this one is an honors curriculum as a special course and two special courses of studies, special programs of study that I'm actually excited about uh, because this is right in line with our strategic plan project lead the way which is a CCT, College and Career Technical Education, Engineering and Computer Science uh, um, elective focus and Engineering by Design, which again, by its description is engineering. Uh, so we do recommend approval of the uh, special course and the special programs of study. Board members, is there a motion to approve? Dan Cash to approve. Mr. Cash makes the motion to approve. Is there a second? Second, Candy Emerson. Ms. Emerson makes the second. Any discussion, board members? I see no discussion. Ms. Glenn? Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Olivia Glenn. Angela Durham? Angela Durham, yes. Dan Cash? Dan Cash, yes. Elliot Mitchell? Elliot Mitchell, yes. Brad Fiscus? Brad Fiscus, yes. Jenna Priya? Jenna Priya, yes. Jay Galbraith. Jay Galbraith, yes. Sheila Cleveland. Sheila Cleveland, yes. Candy Emerson. Candy Emerson, yes. Rick Wimberly, yes. Welch. Eric Welch, yes. Casey Hall. Casey Hall, uh, yes. Nancy Garrett. Nancy Garrett, yes. Your vote is 12, yes. Zero, no. Motion passes. Board members, staff, and those viewing this meeting, uh, that concludes our agenda. Mr. Golden, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, Madam Chair, I just want to thank everyone uh, for the robust discussion. You know that when we started this about nine months ago with COVID, that we knew that there were going to be some, some tough times. And I really do appreciate uh, the discussion as we continue to work for, uh, for doing what we can to keep all our students first. So thank you, board. Board members, thank you for your time and attention and hope to see some of you at the vaccine clinic sometime this week or next.